Is it on? It is on. I'm glad to see you all here after the banquet. Uh, thanks for being here this morning. So today we have uh, Kyung Yun Cho with us. It's a big pleasure. So Kyung Yun Cho is a, one of the world leading experts on natural language processing. And it's a privilege for us to have him here at, uh, at, at this school. So just a, a few words about him. So he's currently uh, an associate professor at NYU, New York U University. Uh, and before that, he was at SIFAR with Yoshua Benju as a postdoc, I guess. Yeah. And uh, I just found out that he got his PhD in Europe, actually, in Aalto University uh, in Finland some years ago. Not many. <laughs> He's still pretty young. And so thank you for being here with us. I'm, I'm looking forward to your uh, lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning. Um, after you know, I did drinking all those wine yesterday, it's pretty rough, right? And then, but you know, it's even worse because you know, in this era of the ChatGPT, how are, how how is anybody supposed to teach natural language processing, right? And the first thing we uh, tell my students these days is to open up you know, your your web browser, go to you know chat.openai.com, and it actually answers most of the questions that you have. So, in fact, uh, earlier this year in February, I was asked to give a lecture on natural language processing in the you know latin american machine learning summer school in uruguay so of course i agreed to do that you know i did last year summer around july but then you know, of course there was a pre chat gpt now i was supposed to teach natural language processing to all the people there and then you know, of course everyone including all your yourselves you know they already have tried chat gpt you know that the language model works really really well so i thought okay what am i going to teach so yesterday, Noah was able to go through all those important historical, let's say, uh, details of how we got here in terms of the language model. And then today I'm going to first uh, talk very kind of as a high level overview about the, what we would call as a modern day natural language processing. And then there is very much focus on using neural networks and then you have to building on that uh, language models or the sequence to sequence models. And then after that, I'm going to actually spend much, most of the remainder of the lectures on hyperparameter tuning. So what does it mean to do hyperparameter tuning in this new era of language models? And then, you know, if you recall from the yesterday's lecture by Noah Smith, you know, before, let's say this kind of large scale, very large scale language models, it was very clear. So we have a training examples, we have validation examples, and we have the, we had the test examples. And then we always ensure that the, all these uh, sets were not overlapping with each other. And then that allowed us to estimate the, okay, estimate the generalization error very, very accurately. Unfortunately, nowadays, who knows you know, how OpenAI is training these models, how Google is training these models. And then even if you train these models yourself, you actually often don't know how to inspect the entire training set to start with. So then what is the right way to think about it? You know, that's what we are going to talk about quite a lot. And because, Thanks to ChatGPT, everyone knows, including yourselves, you probably know even more about transformers than I do. So, you know, we hope that this lecture is, uh, I hope that this lecture is going to be rather interactive. If you have any questions or the comments, do raise your hand, you know, let's talk about that, you know, as freely as we can. But anyway, what is natural language processing? In order to think about the natural language processing in this new era, we need to talk about the, okay, why we even care about language? And then why is everyone going crazy about language suddenly? Until about, let's say, five years ago, eight years ago, you go to, let's say, machine learning conferences or the AI conferences, and then you tell people that, they, well, you know, I work on natural language processing. I work on, let's say, machine learning algorithms through the language. They will tell you that, they, you know, they, they wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't be considered the mainstream. But now, suddenly, about two years ago, everything changed. Every, everyone somehow in natural language, uh, machine learning as well as the AI, more broadly, AI, tells me that, okay, language is a core thing. So I'm like, okay, something changed, but why is language a core thing, right? So one way to think about it is that the, let's see. One way to think about it is the, you know, one, one way to kind of approach this question, why is language so central now, is to think about the human language itself. And then you, what you notice is that the human language or the natural language that we use is extremely unique. It's compositional and is productive. And then what that means is that, you know, we really can produce all those as infinitely many variations of the, let's say expressions that in fact rep, uh, rep, reflect whatever we're thinking inside in, in our head. And it's also open-ended. We can create new words, we can create new sentences, we can create new paragraphs whenever we want. That's often not the case with the many other modalities that we work with. Visual modalities, great. 
but that only reflects what we see in the world. But on the other hand, when it comes to language, you have to, we just make up stuff nonstop. And then the interesting thing is that the people talk about the fact-checking, truthfulness, and so on, but the language is almost by definition fake. It's never, let's say, perfect, let's say, reflection of the word, because we have to make some abstraction always in order to put it into the language. And then we can also refer to abstract concepts and hypotheticals. It's really difficult to think about the hypotheticals if you're working with the, let's say, visual concepts or the auditory concepts or any kind of modalities that are very grounded. But with the language, we can talk about the hypotheticals that never happen, will never happen, and would never happen ourselves. And then trying to make some kind of, let's say, the reasoning out of it as well. So that's really interesting. And then the interesting thing is that it also connects to the experience. So how do we actually know some of the things? Because you know, we see some of them, we hear about them, we're going to touch on them, we're going to taste them. And then that's how we actually know about things. And then that is by experience. And then you need to think about, okay, how we actually learn skills as well. How do we learn to cook? How do we learn to walk? How do we learn to run and all those things? How do we learn to backflip if, uh, if you know how to do that? Is by actually trying it out. And then you know, that's what you probably learned already about the reinforcement learning is that you tried it out in order to learn to acquire skill sets. But then that's actually really, really super limiting. It's impossible that we have to experience everything in order to learn about something. For instance, somehow in this room, I'm pretty sure every single one of you knows how people lived in ancient Greece, although I'm pretty sure not a single one of us lived or the experienced the life in ancient Greece. But somehow we know about them. We even know what they believed in back then. We know about what kind of philosophy actually happened back then. And I'm pretty sure almost none of you, including myself, in fact, has been to Antarctica ourselves. Mario, have you been to Antarctica? No, okay. So not a lot of people have been to Antarctica, but we somehow all know that the penguins live in Antarctica. So what that means is that the knowledge we have actually has almost nothing to do with the real experience that we have these days. It may have been true, like, I don't know, centuries ago, tens of centuries ago, maybe tens of hundreds of thousands of years ago. But nowadays, what we know, so knowledge and the skills that we have are extremely, extremely detached from the real experience that we have. And then the reason is because we have language. And language is what expands the horizon of experience. And then this also touches a lot, uh, touches upon the huge debate that is being done, that is being had uh, by the community as well as the society in general about the, how much these large scale language models know. And then there's always a small set of the people who, who say that, well, language models cannot really know much because language models do not experience nor you know, the uh, sense the word directly. But then if you think about it, a lot of what we know already are detached from our own experience anyway. Never been to ancient Greeks, never been to Antarctica, you know, in fact, never been to most of the countries in the world, but I know a lot about you know, how people live and what is happening in this world because of language. That's how we know things. So what that means is that the language is really turned out to be a key. And then you know, that's what a lot of people already knew for the past, say, half a century or so, because it really expands the horizon of experience. It expands our horizon of experience in terms of space. So, you know, we have never been to a lot of places, but we know about them because we heard about it. Somebody explained to us. And also even time as well, because our experience doesn't have to be confined to our lifetime. But we know about what has happened, let's say, centuries ago, tens of centuries ago, even before, thanks to language. So I hope that you know, this actually really gives you the sense that, okay, language is really important. And it's always been important and people are just realizing it. And then it's unsurprising at this point that these kind of large scale language models know a lot of the things because it's just like us. Real experience or the direct experience only constitute a small part of you know, how we acquire knowledge as well as the skill set. And the language is what expands how much we know and then how much we can do without necessarily having to try out every single one of them ever. And then this is really interesting because if you uh, remember from yesterday, both the Noah Smith lecture as well as the Yejin Choice lecture in the evening, is that the, these language models or the language is touching not only upon the natural language processing, but robotics, vision, and everything that you can imagine. Because it turned out that language is a way for us to encode a lot of knowledge into our systems. 
Now, so then, you know, the, of course, you know, the, uh, one, can, one might simply say that, well, language is, is it language really different? What if it's just like visual perception? Maybe it's just like the auditory perception. So maybe we shouldn't really treat it that differently from all the other modalities. Because you know, the, if it's just uh, how, how we perceive the word, why would it be different at all? But uh, unfortunately, language is actually quite unique in a sense that it's really unlike, let's say, vision or audi auditory, you know, the, uh, let's say, signal, signals that we receive, because it's just a resource of our intellectual ca capability. It's nothing that the universe actually gave us. It's just something that we just created ourselves. And then in other words, although we call it natural language, it's extremely artificial and not at all natural. I mean, there's nothing natural about our language. And what that actually means uh, for in practice for us is that there is no inherent nor natural concept of similarity. So the example you see here, there are three words, quit, quite, quiet. If you think about how similar these words are in terms of how they are written, with each other, they're extremely similar, just a one letter different from each other. But if you think about the meaning of individual words here, it cannot be different from each other. Like the quit versus let's say quite have absolutely no, no let's say similarity in the meaning. Quite and then quiet, even worse. Although they are really next to each other in terms of the pronunciation as well as the writing of orthography as well. So really there's no natural concept of similarity. This is very different from, for instance, vision. If I see an image, and then if the image is slightly, let's say, tilted, meaning doesn't really change, the identity of the object doesn't really change that much. But in language, it immediately switches. And then it's even worse if you think about how many languages we have in this world. So the, you know, there is no like the, I don't know, perfect agreement, but people say, uh, people say that there are more than 7,000 living languages in the world. So the living languages as in the language that are being spoken by at least, I don't know, two or three people at any time uh, of the uh, day. And then interesting thing is that we can always go back and forth between almost any pair of these languages. You pick, let's say, Korean, and then you pick, let's say, Portuguese. Whatever you say in Portuguese, you can always translate into the in Korean and then vice versa. But at the same time, these languages how, uh, rarely share any common forms. So you see quit, quite, quiet on the right uh, column. Those are the corresponding Korean words. Absolutely no similarity. You, can, you really cannot infer anything by just looking at these uh, three pairs of the words. So then you know, we need to figure out, okay, how to capture these similarities that don't exist naturally. And then we go all the way back to, let's say, Firth and others from the you know, early 20th century as well as the mid 20th century. And then where you know, they were pushing, pushing for this idea of the distribution hypothesis. That is that they, we're not going to try to figure out the meaning of a word on its own, but we're going to look at the context in which these words appear. And then of course, this context should be interpreted broadly in particular in light of the recent advances in this kind of multimodal language models. So we're not only going to look at the textual context, but we can also look at the multimodal context. And the multimodal context really helps. If you look at the one example I put, uh, picked up from the Twitter, uh, the Twitter account called the Book of Rather Strange Animals. It's a fascinating Twitter account, by the way. You should definitely follow it. You know, this, they are going to post the uh, pictures of all those crazy animals that you've never heard of, and then they are all real. And then one of the examples I saw was the elephant trunk snake. If you only look at that tweet itself, read it without looking at the image, you have absolutely no idea what that is. I mean, the elephant trunk snake. But as soon as you look at an accompanying image, you immediately know that the, oh, this is a snake that looks like the elephant's trunk. So you get a better sense by looking at this kind of much broader context beyond language. So, you know, what does it mean? You already learned about it from Noah yesterday, but let's go through it once more. What does this mean? Uh, what does this distributional hypothesis actually tell us? Say you, know, the, you want to know what NYU was. What you can do is that you can go to Wikipedia and then search for NYU, and then you're going to find tons of pages that mention NYU from Wikipedia article. And then what you're going to do is you're going to collect every sentence that has NYU in it. And then you're going to find, let's say NYU, also, uh, some sentences such as NYU also has two overseas degree granting campuses, NYU Abu Dhabi and NYU Shanghai, and has distant, uh, distant academic centers. New York University, Shanghai, the Porter campus is part of NYU's global network university. New York University 
NYU is one of the world's premier residential research and teaching institutions and so on and on and on. And then what you see is that there are a lot of words that appear together with the NYU across all those sentences. And then that actually gives you the sense of, okay, what NYU is. NYU seems to mean, let's say, New York University. NYU seems to mean you know, some kind of university. NYU seems to mean some kind of center. And then also NYU seems to be a school. And then this is how the context gives rise to meaning. Now we have to be a bit careful. Now this context was, context, context was there because somebody actually wrote it. So we're going to get to that point as well. So there's a bit of a chicken or egg let's say, problem here. But given some kind of large amount of the corpus, we can get the meaning of an individual word by looking at the context in which it appears. And then it's very easy to see such an example. You can literally go into Google and then search for any word. And then you notice that the, by looking at in which context the word appears, you can know the meaning of the word, even if the word you've never, uh, even if you've never heard about the word before. Now, what we can now do is that we can create a, something called the word co-occurrence matrix, right? Again, from the yesterday as well. And then we're going to really literally count how often a target word appears together with the other words or the other phrases as well. And then in fact, you can think about building it with the other sentences, paragraphs as well. And then we can create a really large co-occurrence uh, co matrix. So the rows corresponds to the words that we want to know the meaning of, and the columns corresponds to all possible phrases that these words could actually have appeared together with. And then for each of the entries, we look at how often these two, the target word and the phrase appear together or they co-occur together. And that's going to be just a count. And then, in fact, this is word vectors. So this is just a collection of the word vectors because as distribution hypothesis tells us, what is the, uh, the context in which a word appears is already telling us about the meaning of the words. So this is the very basic form of the word vector. So what was the co-occurrence count, co count given any particular word? Now it turned out that this is actually really, really unsatisfactory because not a lot of things co-occur together. So most of the entries in this vector will be zeros. And if there are so many zeros in this kind of high dimensional space, all these vectors will always be orthogonal to each other, almost orthogonal to each other, meaning that if you look at the dot product between let's say two word vectors, and then use that as a way to check the similarity between two word vectors, it's going to be almost always close to zero. And then that doesn't really help. And then this is where the, uh, the issue of the sparsity comes in. So that is that the, if we look at the training example, a training set, and then trying to generalize into new cases in the test set, unfortunately, it's too sparse to the point that the, whatever the word co-occurrence or the co-occurrence counts that we get are meaningless. We can't really use them directly ourselves. So then what we, have, what we do is that we actually do the compression. That is, we use a matrix factorization or neural net training in order to get a dense vector representation that captures all those similarity structures while ignoring all those unnecessary dimensions. And then we can use PCA to do that. You probably learned PCA. You can train an autoencoder. You probably have learned that as well. And you can also train this kind of autoregressive models or whatnot. I'm going to talk about that briefly uh, a bit later today. And then once we do this kind of matrix factorization, which is essentially exactly what we do with any kind of neural network, then we get a dense vectors dense vectors for all the words that we are interested in. And then you know, the, what this means is that the, really we can now use this vector to check the similarities of all these different words based on the context in which they appeared. And then this is really important because we do not want to use the surface form of any of the words or the language in order to tell whether they are similar with each other or not. We really have to extract out this hidden structure behind the text in order to do something about it without being boggled down by this kind of a say surface form that is really pretty much meaningless. So then you know, at the, uh, it turned out that this kind of word vectors that we, you get, and it's really simple. You can literally write this down using SciPy or the scikit-learn in about, let's say, I don't know, 12 lines, starting from the Wikipedia and then get the word vectors by just running PCA. Like literally you run the PCA, you get all these word vectors and then you do get something similar to what you see here on the screen. And then what we see is that the, by just doing the matrix factorization, we actually get a quite uh, you know, interesting compositional representation of the language. Now, are they really compositional? As Yejin said yesterday, who knows? Maybe to a certain degree, maybe not fully. But the point here is that the, 
really looking at the data and then looking at the co-occurrence of the different entities, we can now get the meaning that is on the line, the surface forms that are largely, largely meaningless. And then these are indeed compositional and very, very meaningful as you will be able to check yourself if you really you know, sit down, open up the Jupyter notebook and then load the scikit-learn and then just uh, try, try it out. But then you have to, who really cares about words, right? That's a big question. If you think about the language, words are the, like the very first thing. And then what is actually interesting is that how the words are going to be connected with each other. So as to give rise to a infinitely many possible, let's say meanings that we want to express using language. And this is a image that I took from the Borhovi and Levin 2006. Uh, this is about the machine translation. But then you know, if you uh, see this, you know, this is not how we build the machine translation systems anymore, by the way. But I think it has a really nice conceptual, let's say, uh, con concepts encoded in this is that the, what we want is when we read text, we start from the text, we're going to look at all those words, and then we're going to look at how those words are syntactically composed. And then based on that, we're going to try to extract out the semantics. So the meaning of those phrases, words, and whatnot. And then we're going to get the, like, the true meaning behind it that is completely detached from the surface level form of how the text was written. And then how we write it is somewhat similar. So we're going to add in some kind of, let's say, individual meanings to the units, let's say, phrases and whatnot. And then we're going to compose them syntactically. And then finally, we're going to put individual words so that we get the target, let's say, sentence. And then this actually gives us a really nice conceptual picture. But how we build the system has nothing to do with you know, this picture, but this is just conceptually nice. And then the interesting thing is that, as I said earlier, there's a chicken or egg problem here, is that the, we said that, okay, context gives rise to the meaning of an individual word. But that also means that the, if you have the individual words and then their composition, that also gives rise to the meaning of the text itself. So then can we actually use these two in order to build a system that is not only going to work on words or the individual words, but on the actual text? And the interesting thing is that the, when you get this kind of word vectors, however you do it, you run PCA, you train autoencoder, you train word to vec, whatever. What you see is that the, we always use a very high dimensional vector to encode a multiple degrees of similarities. Let's say I want to look at the notebook. Notebook has at least two different meanings, right? It's two senses of meaning. So one is that, okay, it's a notebook where you write things on, right? Something like, I don't know, diary, sketchbook, you know, at the end and so on. But the other sense that you can, you know, which is actually more dominant these days is electronics, right? It's a notebook as electronics that's similar to iPad, Okay, so you probably don't remember iPad. That's a too old. I mean, we use a too old corpus. So let's say iPhone, you know, the laptop, you know, the palm tab. I mean, the, you probably don't remember palm tab either, but palm tab, iPad were things that, you know, there was an actual smartphones before iPhone, you know, a long time ago. But then you know, there is a sense that is electronics, right? And then you know, using this kind of high dimensional vectors to encode the meaning of the notebook is way for us to encode all those different senses of the meaning automatically. And then what I'm showing you here is actually not arbitrary. So we took a machine translation system and then we found the word vector that corresponds to notebook. I just ran the PCA and then we we're looking at the first two principal component and then look at the nearest words to this notebook according to each of the, these principal components. So first principal component turned out to be about the notebook that we write on. And then the other one turned out to be the uh, notebook as an electronics. So these, all these different meanings are actually encoded in a word vectors or the, whatever the vectors you get. Now, unfortunate thing is that, okay, so it's ambiguous. So when I say notebook, what, what am I referring to? We actually don't know by just looking at the notebook, but if you look at what are the other words that appear together, I can now identify exactly what I meant by notebook. So for instance, if I use the word notebook in the sentence that is, I use the notebook to join the lecture online, because I saw online in the context, I can tell that it was about the electronics, not the, you know, the, the paper base as a notebook that I'm referring to. And then what that means is that the, we can now start thinking about combining or the obtaining a new vector of an individual word by combining all the other vectors that appear together. And then that's where the attention mechanism comes in. So attention mechanism is something that we, you know, you didn't learn yesterday, but it's actually one of the central components in building many of the existing, let's say, modern neural network these days. 
So let's say, let's take this sentence as an example. I use a notebook to join the lecture online. And then for each of the words in this sentence, I have a vector or word vector that I get. But of course, these word vectors are all very ambiguous. If I look at the notebook and then look at the notebook vector, I don't know whether I'm talking about the electronics or not. So then what tension mechanism is going to do is take, take one vector, so notebook vector, and then it's going to compare against another words vector. So for instance, in this case, online vector. And then based on looking at these two, it, can, it now knows that, okay, it's important to look at the online vector in order to disambiguate the vector of the notebook or the meaning of the notebook, and it's going to assign a high probability or the high weight on the particular word. And then that's often what we refer to as attention weight. And then it does it for every single word you find in the context, in the sentence. And then now we get different, let's say, attention weights given to different words within the context, given this central word notebook. And then we're going to do, uh, compute the weighted sum of this. By computing the weighted sum, we now get a contextualized word vector of the notebook. So the idea is that the, we learned about the convolutional network yesterday, we learned about the recurrent net yesterday, we learned about a lot of different ways to build a neural net that's going to summarize the context and try to predict some of the missing words. And then this summarization process can be thought of as contextualizing what you see at individual position with respect to all the other words that appear together. And then attention mechanism is a very explicit way in which we build that kind of lesson mechanism. That is, how do we get the contextualized word vector of any individual word? And then of course, we can apply this to every word in the sentence. We can do the same thing for I, we can do the same thing for use, we can do the same thing for A, we can do the same thing for notebook and all the way until the end of this sequence. So that is, if you have this attention mechanism, and then add in a bit of a nonlinear uh, projection because nonlinearity is really important. That's probably what you've been hearing every day so far. And what we end up with is that this attention mechanism transforms a set of vectors or a set of words into a set of contextualized representation or the vectors. Now, after applying this attention plus nonlinear projection once, we get a slightly more contextualized representation of the input sentence. I use a notebook to join the lecture online. And what do we do in modern day, let's say machine learning? We make them deep, we just stack them over and over. So we're going to put another attention plus a nonlinear projection layer. We're going to do it over and over in order to get enough contextualization happening. And then this is what we call transformers. So we stack a lot of attention followed by the nonlinear projection. And then we end up with what we, often, uh, what we now refer to as transformers. And then the surprisingly, this transformer is not a new idea. Right? It was proposed in 2017, which is like the ages ago in how quickly, how many papers are, uh, the rate at which the papers are published these days in machine learning. However, the, exactly the idea from 2017 is what we use still, except for a small tweaks here and there. Right? Where are we going to put the layer now? Are we going to put it before or after the nonlinear layer? What kind of position or embedding are we going to use? Are we going to use a cosine embedding? Are we going to use the absolute embedding? Are we going to use a, now this rotary you know, the position embedding or not? But generally those are kind of the say details, but this is exactly what we still do every day when we train this kind of large scale language models. Now, of course, uh, attention mechanism does this, but we, we actually haven't really talked about you know, how it actually does it. Because I mean, how the hell does it know that the online, the word online is important in order to disambiguate the meaning of the word notebook? And then also how do we get the word vectors from the beginning other than running PCA on the co-occurrence matrix? It turned out that the, the nice thing about deep learning or you know, what we call now end-to-end -end learning is that we don't have to worry about that. All we need to worry about is to think about the, what is the objective function that we want to maximize or minimize. Now, there's a huge issue with this, as Yejin pointed out yesterday, is that the, there's no such thing as a true objective function that we want to maximize or minimize. There's no single objective function that we want to maximize or minimize. We always come up with a simple to compute or simple to define proxy objective, and then we're trying to maximize that one. So there's always going to be a bit of a gap between what we really want to do and then what we can do. But let's just assume for now that the gap doesn't exist. So we know what is the exact ob objective function is. Then what would be that exact, let's say proxy objective function that we want to use? And then we go again back to the distribution hypothesis. 
So as we talked about, the meaning of the word arises from the context in which it appears. What that means is that the, if I have a good sense of what the context means, I should be able to tell which word should show up in the part that is missing. So the funny thing is that distribution hypothesis goes both ways. So distribution hypothesis tells us that in order to get the meaning of a word, I need to look at the context in which it appears. And also it says that if I know the context, then I should be able to identify which word is going to come in in the missing portion. In other words, the good objective is for us to train this kind of model to fill in missing words. So on the left side of this slide, you see that, okay, we're going to miss, uh, leave out some of the words in an arbitrary position. So instead of I use a notebook to join the lecture online, we're going to say, well, what if I didn't know what the fourth word was? What if I didn't know the final word was? Can my model be able to fill them in by looking at the context that is the available words? I use A something to join the lecture something. You can actually tell very easily that your case is going to be either notebook, laptop, phone, or Zoom after pandemic now, right? Yes. And then we all know that it's going to be online or remotely. Now, another way that is on the right-hand side of this slide is that, the, well, I'm going to keep all the previous words intact. And then if I have enough context there, I should be able to fill out what's going to happen or the, what should be written down later on. And then that's like the text completion. And then this also corresponds to what we often refer to nowadays as a next word prediction. So for instance, if I knew that, okay, I use a notebook too, then I should be able to fill out the rest of the sentence pretty easily. And then this machine that we're building has to be able to do that. For instance, if I say that, okay, I use the notebook too, our language model should be able to complete it by saying, that, okay, to play StarCraft every day. If you're a Korean high school student in late 90s, that would be the perfect, let's say, perplexity one kind of, let's say, completion, right? Or if you're Yan Lekun in late 80s, you know, it will be like the train of convolution network. Again, perplexity one, let's say, you know, at the completion. Or you know, the, many of the people in general use the notebook to record their ideas. So to record my ideas, there will be a highly probable, let's say, completion as well. So our goal is to train a transformer to perform these jobs. And then what is the good thing about this kind of this, obje this, this objective is that we actually don't need any kind of annotations. All we need is just a large amount of the data that consists of the text that has been written by humans. And then you know, the, this is the idea where in the, the left side uh, that we, I talked about is going to be called mask language modeling. So we're going to mask out some of the words and then train this transformer to predict those missing parts given the context. And then this is what I see idea. I mean, mask language modeling itself is not really a new idea, but in 2018, Jacob Devlin and others from Google train a massive, well, not in ours, not, not in modern standard, but back then it was a massive model with the objective of the mask language model. And then it was all just based on the back propagation. We set out the objective function and then we compute the gradient of that objective function with respect to all those parameters using the back propagation and then use the stochastic gradient descent and they trained it. And they trained for back then about a month or so. Nowadays, uh, BERT, I think that we can train in about uh, less than a week, but you know, back then you know, they had to do that. And then this actually changed a lot of what we mean by, let's say, doing a natural language processing is that we build a gigantic massive language model using a massive amount of, let's say, data we can collect without much of the annotation. And then we're going to find, uh, train them to predict all those missing bits. And then you, know, you could actually see that, okay, these models were exactly learning what it was supposed to do. What was the attention mechanism supposed to do? It's supposed to disambiguate the meaning of individual word based on the context in which it appears. So the Cohen, Rafe, Yuan et al. from 2019, actually they did some analysis. And then this is one of the favorite, let's say, figure from their paper is that they looked at this word lie or li, depending on the context that you want to consider. And then now it can be you know, at the, okay, making up stuff and then telling people the incorrect stuff, lie, or the, let's say, li as in li group. Or you can think about the lie as in the lying down on the ground and so on. Now, does it actually happen? It turned out that if you look at the vector after the several layers of the attention, so it actually takes, uh, and you get the contextualized word embedding of the lie, 
then what you see is that they are indeed well clustered according to the context in which they appear. So you're going to see the mathematical sense on one side, you're going to see the untruth, let's say verb as in you are saying something that is untruth on one side, you're going to see the geographical, you know, like as in you the island kind of thing on the one side, and then you're going to see that, okay, lie down on another side and so on. So it turned out that indeed by using this kind of objective function, we could train a large scale model that is really doing nothing but creating, uh, producing a contextualized vector of the individual positions in this text over and over. And it was indeed doing exactly what we wanted to do. Now, of course, the story that I just told you is a you know, story in hindsight. You know, like, of course, when we are building all those things, we never knew that it was going to happen in this particular way, but it turned out this is exactly what we needed to do from the very beginning. So the one of the standard approaches, of course, People are going to tell you that the well standard approach nowadays is to use this gigantic, let's say, autoregressive left to right model and then doing the prompt tuning and so on, or you know, doing some kind of, let's say, I don't know, like the LoRa, let's say, fine tuning and whatnot. That's what is popular or that, that is what is trendy. But in reality, in practice, what, what often works and what is often being deployed is this kind of pre training and fine tuning paradigm based on the mass language model type of thing in practice. So you train this kind of a say mask language model or any kind of language model, very large one on a large amount of data. And then you attach a classifier on top and then you fine tune the whole thing on a small amount of the label data. Now this actually is a very high level conceptual framework and can, apply, can be applied to any kind of problems that you want to solve as well as any kind of models that you have. Because at the end of the day, one thing for sure is that the unlabeled examples are abundant. You can always find them anywhere. There's all there. They are never going to be perfectly aligned with what we want to do, but you just narrow down the gap by collecting a bit of let's say labeled examples. Or as Yejin told you yesterday, you know, you use the same language model over, over and over with some kind of a bit of a human human let's say weak supervision. Although I think the there are some let's say issues there. You know, the, to to be strict, but you know, that's for the future uh, for us a uh, future us to you know figure out. But then of course, what I've been talking about was generally about reading part, but the language is pretty meaningless if we can, it can only read because the language is a you know, system intended to communicate ideas from a speaker to a listener. And then what that means is that, okay, we have to think about the generation and that's where the really exciting thing happens. And according to Yejin, that might be easier problem than actually understanding the text. But if you think about it, generation is really the other side of the coin because whoever understands should be able to generate for the other speaker anyway. So it's actually kind of, I say, the exactly the same problem that we need to solve between the understanding and generation. And interesting thing is that the generation is classification, a special form of classification. So let's see, I have an image, you see, the image you see, there is a gi giant panda just lying down, you know, at the enjoying their li uh, his life. And then now generate, let's say I'm doing the image caption generation. What is the simplest way to solve this problem is that I'm going to build a classifier that has so many possible classes. And then all those classes correspond to all possible image captions you can imagine. And then what I'm going to do is that yeah, I can train this classifier, you know, this is going to softmax classifier, or yesterday uh, Noah said that the maximum entropy, right? Maximum entropy, or was it minimum? I don't know, everyone wants to use either maximum or the minimum entropy, depending on what they want to do, or you know, depending on how easy it is to write a paper. But anyway, let's say we're going to use a maximum entropy classifier. And then you know, at the, I'm going to train it so that the log probability assigned to this giant panda bear is as high as possible. And then while the log probability assigned to all the other possible captions is very, very low. So in fact, generation is really classification. And then the right-hand side, I'm showing you another example of the translation. Input is going to be panda ga hangaro yushigo isimida. That's like the Korean sentence. And then what we want to do is that we build a classifier that's going to assign a highest possible log probability to the correct translation out of all possible translations. So in that sense, generation is classification. Let's hope that you know, we can agree on this one. But also at the same time, generation is not necessary, not like usual classification. In classification, in particular, in this kind of softmax classification or the multinomial classification, what was the one thing that was implicitly assumed is that the, all these classes are rather independent of each other. There's no, let's say, hidden structures that 
provide us the similarities across all these classes. So there is no known structure among classes a priori until we actually observe the input. But in the case of the generation, each and every class in this classification is a composition of the simpler units. So what do I mean by that? Let's say I want to do the generation and then gen, uh, you know, the sentence that I want to generate is a giant panda bear is resting leisurely. We know that the, the first word is coming out of the large vocabulary of all possible words. Second one, again, the same thing. So one of the words from the same vocabulary, third one, fourth one, fifth one, sixth one, seventh one, all the way. So it's really different in a sense that the each and every class or the each and every possible generated text is going to be somewhat related to all the other classes. And then we know how they are related to each other. There's a compositional structure that we that exists and that we should be able to exploit that. So for instance, you know, at the, in the case of the machine translation, uh, how we actually use this underlying compositional structure. Starting with the source sentence, we're going to try to predict the first word in the translation. And then given the source sentence and the first word that has been predicted correctly, we're going to try to predict the next word in the translation. And then we continue to do so until we uh, decode out or the predict the final word in the translation. So we can now use this kind of compositional structure in order to, let's say, generate one word at a time or one token at a time, rather than trying to look at the all possible translations in the universe and then pick the one that has the highest score according to our model. And then once the, the sequence of the predictions is done, we're going to combine them to get the actual translation or the whatever the text that you, our model tells us to generate. And in this particular case, a giant panda bear is resting leisurely, which is a correct translation of the source sentence. So what we do is that the we do the next word prediction. And then this next word prediction is exactly the objective that we talked about in order to pre-train or to train this kind of large scale language model that is going to be subsequent, subsequently, let's say, fine tuned. So what that means is that this is exactly what we, are, we, what we talked about is that the generation and the recognition or understanding are two sides of the same coin. It's exactly the same technology. We're going to use transformers so that consists of the many layers of the attention mechanism followed by the nonlinear projection in order to train this model to get contextualized individual words. What, what did we have to do? We had to train a model to be a language model. And then one of the good objectives there was the next word prediction. And then it turned out that the next word prediction is precisely what we use in order to build a generation system. So really like, there's just a, only one thing in natural language, modern natural language processing that is a next word prediction or the language modeling that allows us to build a system that is able to understand or to disambiguate the meanings of all these words by looking at the context and also allows us to build a system that is able to generate a very, very fluent text. So I actually did copy and paste a lot of, you know, I did the figures that I used at the first half of this lecture, because it's exactly the same technology. Only thing that you need to do if you want to implement it yourself is to just make sure that you mask out the vectors from the future so that you're not going to predict the next word by looking at the next word. That's about it. And then it's exactly the same technology. And then nowadays it's become so standard to the point that the, even NVIDIA has a CUDA kernel that actually corresponds to transformers as well. So it's very easy to use. And they even have a special core on their chip that handles the transformers almost explicitly as well. And then it turned out, what is the good thing about this kind of uh, you know, neural net? And then I shouldn't actually talk about it too much because tomorrow you're going to learn about the multimodal or the uh, vision and language models from the Desmond. But the idea is that the, as soon as we can get a vector, it really doesn't matter what the surface form was. So why are we using this kind of neural nets? And then why, are, why, why did we talk about the word, vec uh, word vectors in the first place? Because we really don't want to get a representation that represent the surface form. We want to throw away the surface form and then get a representation that tells us about the similarities among all these words and the objects that are on, uh, underneath. And then what that means is that once we get a word vector, we can throw away how it was written to start with. 
And how it was written could very well be how it was drawn as well. So what people do is that they're going to just run a convolutional network on an image and then get a set of vectors and then plug that in as part of the input word vectors in addition to whatever text was written down. And then from there on, everything is exactly the same. Again, all those that say multimodal models that you're going to learn about, or at least the modern ones, they look exactly the same as the ones that I just told you. It's going to be a stack of many, many uh, attention layers followed by the nonlinear projections. And really nothing changes. And then these models are going to be trained with the exactly same objective that is language models. And then these are really, these work really pretty well. I actually, you know, I'm showing you some samples from many years ago, as in two years ago. So, you know, it was already working pretty well. Nowadays it works even better. And if this elusive, let's say, multimodal capability of the GPT-4 eventually becomes, let's say, available to the public, hopefully we'll see even more amazing things happening there. And then of course, this exactly the same thing that exact, exactly the same technology is used, used to build the machine translation systems, speech recognition systems, dialogue systems, you know, alt text generation, whatever you can imagine uses the same technology nowadays. Makes everything so much easier, right? So the fewer things for us to learn and then keep track of. Unlike before, before, you know, the, before transformers and attention mechanism, we had to build a machine translation system on its own, we had to have a bespoke way of building it. We had to have a bespoke way to build a speech recognition system. Dialogue systems, in particular, the task-oriented dialogue systems, I don't know how people actually even built it, it's so complicated. They're like, dialogue state tracker, blah, blah, intention prediction, blah, blah, blah. No one really knows exactly what goes in. Only people in the AWS was able to use it, I heard in practice. But anyway, it was very complicated, but nowadays it's so much easier. What I just told you, distribution hypothesis, Base construction of the attention mechanism with the language modeling as objective is exactly what the modern NLP tells us that we should have done and that we should continue to do. Now, that said, okay, so this doesn't have, uh, this you know, is, is a kind of reserve of the about half a century of the progress ever since you had know, the uh, close general or the mathematical theory of communication. I'm going to actually talk about in the second part a bit uh, what, what it means to uh, think about compression. So it's been going on. And then it's been a series of the successes because every success is followed by the failure. So the previous success en ends up being failure, but still the, it's, a, it's been a series of the success. But then you at the, we are now at a point we start seeing a bit of a, a few of the fundamental issues in this kind of statistical approach to natural language processing. In fact, some of the issues that Yejin uh, pointed out yesterday very well connect to these kind of fundamental issues. And I'm going to just uh, touch upon one fundamental issue, I think, which I think is really important uh, before I kind of say move on to more kind of say down to earth, let's say technical topics of today. But before we talk about the fundamental issues, is there any, I don't know, questions or comments about what I have talked about so far? Or has it been like super clear? Yeah. What are the recent solutions to it? And also, imagine we have a uh, my second question is about imagine we have a sparse data and uh, which one is to put better locally attention or global attention? Oh, yeah, okay. So, there are two questions. One question is that this let's say we got these vectors, okay, either from the first layer or the later layers. What is the right way to measure the similarity between a pair of those vectors? Unfortunately, we actually don't have like the good answer here now, but interesting thing is that the, there is no good answer or that there is no right answer because that's actually the choice that we make. For instance, let's say we decided to use PCA or this kind of matrix factorization in order to get these vectors. And then if we put the constraint that the, this left and the right vector uh, matrices you see there are going to be um, constraints so that they are transposed of each other. In that case, what happens is that the, we're saying that the, the dot product of these two word or the word and the phrase vectors needs to end up being very close to the count. And then there, of course, the right, let's say a metric that we need to use is the dot product kernel, which is not really a metric, but anyway, okay, dot product, we can use that one. But then of course, 
once we go beyond this kind of linear model and then thinking about this kind of a say, highly nonlinear model like the transformers, what is the right metric that we can use after several layers of nonlinearity is uh, kind of unclear. And then the interesting thing is that we also don't care about it anymore because we can build a model that's going to give us the actual score at the very end uh, like this. So you know, the, a lot of people and a lot of, let's say, people have tried and then continue to try, trying to decode out what is going on inside this black box neural networks. And then people find it really fascinating, but from my perspective, the whatever is happening inside this kind of neural network that is heavily over, over parameterized, is not really meaningful. There are so many different ways in which you can re-parameterize without changing the function itself, so end-to-end -end function. So what does it mean to actually uh, inspect a particular instantiation of this neural net after one training run? It's kind of as a unclear why we want to do that. Does that actually uh, answer the question? Okay, yeah, so meaningless. Okay, that's the <laughs> answer to the first question. Second question was about Okay, what is the kind of a say particular right way to build this kind of attention mechanism or what kind of constraints do we want to put? Because we often think that when we build this kind of model, we think that we know better than these neural networks. So to the point that we want to add in some of the domain knowledge or the encoding domain knowledge. Now, what is the one kind of particular domain knowledge we know about language model is that the closer words tends to influence, have a greater influence on the particular choice of the word. Words that are further away tends to have an increasingly smaller impact on the choice of the particular word. Now, it's not always like that, but that's kind of let's say, our first order approximation to how the language model should be. And that's the reason why n-gram model with a small n has been used quite extensively over the past let's say, several decades or so. And then that actually makes us think that the, okay, what if we build an attention mechanism so that we put a, uh, so that the, it only attends to a nearby words only? In this particular example, what if all those attention weights are assigned such that the higher attention weights are going to be given to the words that are closer to notebook than the ones that are further away? Now the interesting thing is, whatever we think we have figured out by looking at some amount of data and then talking to some other people are often the very first thing that these neural nets are going to pick up. So that is that it's going to actually learn that the closer nearby words tend to have a higher degree of influence on the choosing the word than the further away ones is the first thing that it's going to learn. So if you look at the attention ways, it already often just show that the nearby words are more important. So do we need to explicitly encode this kind of a say structure ourselves? I'm almost always doubtful that we need to do it because whatever we know is the, often the first thing that can be statistically picked up on by training these models on a large amount of corpus. So the answer is that probably we don't need it unless for the computational efficiency reason, yes. Okay. Any, anything, anyone else? Yes. You said the, the hidden weights, the hidden layers were uh, meaningless. Non-interpretable. Non -interpretable. Yeah, you're right. So, uh, so when I said meaningless, is that the uh, we cannot put any particular meaning that is useful for us to know what is going on inside by looking at a, a particular instance of a neural net that has been trained once. Yes. So yeah, not interpretable, not meaningless. Yeah, it, it is used to compute something that is very meaningful at the end. Yes. Yeah. What is the meaning? That's a big, bigger question. Yeah, what is meaning? So in this particular context, meaning uh, meaning corresponds to interpretability. And then you at the in that sense, it's kind of a say a meaningless as in you are not really interpretable. All right, uh, then we're going to continue. So let's see, we talk. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah. So there are many fundamental issues, by the way, not just one but I'm going to just touch upon one uh, issue that I believe is really important. So let's look at some example, okay? So you see a leaf and a banana. 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 That's the only, only thing you see, right? So the top, rows, top row consists of leaves, bottom row consists of bananas. 
And then you don't really care about the colors that much at this point, right? I mean, I'm not even sure what is the name of the color of the second leaf, for instance. But you know, there, there is a leaf. That's very clear. And then let me ask you this question is that the, are leaves and bananas similar to each other? So in your mind, are they similar to each other? Yeah, yeah, no, okay, no, yes. You know, let's say yes. Then I can give you the reason because both grow from trees. So you see leaves on the trees, you see bananas on trees. I, pres I presume, I'm ready. I don't, wait, are oh, bananas actually grow on trees, right? Okay, okay, good. <laughs> and then I don't think I've seen them actually directly, but anyway. And then both of them are mostly edible. A lot of the leaves are edible. Most of the bananas are edible. So in some sense, they are quite similar to each other, but they are not similar, uh, they are, but it's going to be crazy for us to say that they are similar because of their colors. Sometimes you see a yellow leaves and then you see a yellow banana, you see a green banana, and then you, have to, you see green leaves, but you have to, we don't say that the leaves and bananas are similar to each other because of their colors. We don't say that, right? Right, yes. This is a very clear case. But then you go to, let's say, Google Books and Grand Viewer, and then you look at the relative frequency of, let's say, green leaves, yellow leaves, red leaves, purple leaves, and blue leaves, and the relative frequency of the green bananas, yellow bananas, red bananas, purple bananas, and blue bananas. And then what you see is that the rel relatively saying, the uh, leaf, leaves and bananas are actually very, very similar to each other. Literally, the most frequent color word that appears together with either leaf or bananas is green. And the next is yellow, next is red. And then this is exactly same. So then if we believe that the meaning arises from the context in which a word appears, leaves and bananas are extremely, extremely similar to each other. Thanks to these color words. And then this is what we often refer to as a superior, or the, a superior statistical pattern that is apparently so, but not actually valid. It's kind of like, okay, what is superior? That's a big question. But in this particular example, you can see that the, that is definitely superior. Leaves and bananas are not similar because their colors are similar to each other. It doesn't make any sense. They are similar because they grow on the trees and they are similar because we can eat them uh, most of the times. And then what this means is that there is a ambiguity of the causes in statistical patterns. And then in particular in text, the statistical patterns that we see tend to reflect both intrinsic meaning as well as the extrinsic use. So how, what is the actual meaning of these words? And then how these words are used are both encoded without distinction in this kind of statistical patterns that we get from a large amount of the data we see. So let's take another example. On the left side, you have doctor, medical doctors. And then on the right side, we have nurses. And then how we actually define doctors and nurses actually have nothing to do with the gender of the particular person. It's just that the doctors are the ones who went to the medical school, did this horrible years of the internship and the residency and whatnot. Nurses, again, do did the horrible things, but not at the medical school, but at the nursing school. Their jobs are different, but they are not defined by their gender. But let's just go to the Google and Grand Viewer again. And then I looked at he's a doctor, she's a doctor. And then I looked at she's a nurse and then he's a nurse. And then somehow the pattern, the relative frequency is completely flipped. And then what that means, and the reason why we see this is because the statistical patterns of how we are using the word doctor and nurse reflect the societal biases or how they are often used in the society beyond the word's meaning or the intrinsic meaning. So what that means is that the, one of the biggest fundamental issues that we have with this kind of current, let's say, statistical natural language processing is that the statistical patterns alone cannot really distinguish intrinsic meaning and the extrinsic use. And then we really have to go beyond this kind of statistical paradigm for true language understanding. Now, yesterday, Yejin told you about the, you know, reinforcement learning or the supervised learning in order to you know, disambiguate some of these ambiguities that arise from the statistical, let's say, approaches to language model. But then you know, the, that's that seems like a very, I don't know, like the uh, bandage that's not really the permanent solution at all. 
as Yejin pointed out, the fact of vacuum mode. Uh, whenever we see that, well, okay, so, well, our model captured this superior statistical pattern that you know, the uh, doctors tend to be male and then you know, the nurses tend to be female. We can fix that by saying that, the, well, let's create a lot of annotations of the female doctors and the male nurses in the supervised corpus and the refine to the model of the uh, training. Now, what we're going to find is that the, we're going to find well, you know, the problem has been solved, but we're going to find that the leaves and bananas are similar because of their colors. Then we're going to again, go out there and then create an annotation where we're going to increase the number of the leaves with particular color for which the bananas never show up so that this pattern is going to be broken down. But then what are we going to find? We're going to find yet another issue and then yet another issue. And eventually we can't really handle this by annotation. And then these are the things that we can see immediately and then we can tell thereby we can actually get the annotations, but there are things that we don't even know exist. And there are things that we don't even know what is the right answer. So if you go into slightly more complicated problems, as in let's say medicine, problems in medicine, problems in, I don't know, material design, problems in manufacturing, problems in politics, policy making, there's no such thing as a answer that we can get by just going to the mechanical Turk and then ask, I don't know, five mechanical Turkers, Okay, tell us which molecule is going to be the, uh, I don't know, cure for Alzheimer's. No, no mechanical Turk will be able to tell us the answer. So then how do we actually encode that kind of information correctly or to fix this kind of bias? So that is actually uh, one of the big issues that we have at the moment that we actually know, don't know how to fix it in this kind of large scale. In a very, very small scale, you know, we can run the randomized control trials or the doing kind of, let's say, causal discovery and inference in order to tackle it. But in this kind of a say, re real world kind of a say, high dimensional you know, at the uh, large data regime, we actually don't know what is the right way to do about it. So this is one of the fundamental issues that I wanted to point out. And then now I'm going to dive into a much more technical stuff. But before that, is there any questions that we want to talk about? Oh, what I think is a solution. Uh, uh, I. I actually don't know the solution to this. We, I, I know that, okay, simple observation-based, let's say statistical learning is not going to solve this problem in my view. So, you know, this kind of, let's say, plugging in together with the actual experiments or the actual deployment scenario is uh, one kind of way to address it. But in many cases that can be either unethical or impractical. So I don't know what is the right way to do uh, to this. No idea. Mario, you know the answer? Yeah. I don't know. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> oh, lie. Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, there you go. Yes. Yeah. So, in language, a lot of use of words, you're going to love to use words by analogy. So, when you say polygon does not lie on a flat plane, it's actually the same meaning as some island lie adjacent to the plane. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of something you can't talk about. Yeah, so that's actually, yeah, yeah, uh, so that's actually a great point in a sense that the, of course, the, this kind of, a say, clustering here is somewhat, you know, at the uh, postal clustering, people look at it and then you know, at the annotated it, but, you know, at the, everything is somewhat very ambiguous and, you know, at the, have a, you know, at the kind of, a, it's not dichotomy, but more like the continuum in this kind of models that we have. And then that could be one of the issues that we need to solve. And then that is actually one of the funda uh, one of the other kind of fundamental issues is that the, uh, the neural net, although we have a, is heavily over, over parameterized, heavily nonlinear, but these neural nets, whenever we train them, they tend to be extremely linear and then too smooth to the point that the, a lot of the concepts that are supposed to be crisply separated to each other uh, from each other, sometimes cannot be separated that you know, crisply. And then that is actually a kind of both the blessing and curse. It's blessing in a sense that that allows us to generalize to a kind of a say completely novel way of way in which the things can be combined. But at the same time, it also leads to this kind of a say weird, let's say, uh, you know, people call it hallucination or the adversarial examples because they tend to be too close to each other when they should be very far from, away from each other. And then you know, that's actually, not a coincidence or the not an unexpected thing, but that is very expected from the fact that the we how do we know how to train this kind of large scale models and the highly nonlinear models is because we made them 
with all those residual connections, normalizations and whatnot, so that they actually do look like a linear function in order to avoid the issue of the vanishing gradient and exploring gradient. So we kind of made a neural net to be very smooth and linear because that's the only way in which we can train them. And then now we can train it, but because we started from a very linear and smooth function, we're still too smooth in most of the cases. So, <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of a say my way of answering it. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so everyone is very clear. Now you all are the expert in the modern natural language processing. And then next thing you need to do is just go, uh, pip install the transformers, you know, Xformers, and then create your own corpus and then go to AWS, uh, get an instance that has a 800 or the 300 GPUs and then start training your model. Literally, that is actually, so that's the reason why it's much easier to be an NLP, let's say, practitioner these days than, I don't know, 20 years ago. Joel, how was it? Maybe 20 years, 15 years ago, it was much more complicated. You had to have much more memory, I guess, <laughs> than the GPU. So then, you know, the uh, one is, yeah, yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm going to actually switch to something else, yes. I wanted to actually talk about one thing that I'm going to go about halfway before our coffee, coffee break which is going to be in 20 minutes. So you probably have heard of, okay, well, you know, what is the next paradigm nowadays? Next paradigm, according to OpenAI, is that the, everyone uses OpenAI API and then solve the NLP problems by prompting it really, really well or do a very minimal fine tuning. And even the fine tuning is more like the creating what they call instruction data set so that the, it knows how to read the question and then produce a desirable answer. And then you know, what that means is that it actually connects to the kind of, let's say traditional, well, not too traditional, but the traditional concept of what we call fuchsia learning. And then fuchsia learning, what it says is that the, well, because I have a very well-trained underlying model, I'm going to use a very small number of training examples to build a system that's going to work really, really well. But there is a one big question that you know, a lot of people just avoid talking about is that the, as you have learned, when you train these kind of neural nets, there are many hyperparameters that you need to tune. But if you only have, let's say, 10 training examples, how can you do the hyperparameter tuning? This is a really interesting question that now a lot of people think about is that if I have 10 training examples, how am I going to choose the hyperparameters and when I have more than 10 hyperparameters often to tune? And then it turned out to be it's really important. And then you know, this actually uh, makes us you know, this spend some time to think about, okay, what it means to do fuchsia learning. So let's think about the fuchsia learning, what it means, first of all. So fuchsia learner is really nothing but a function that maps a set of, small set of training examples to a model that's going to solve the problem. And then we're going to say that we're going to use a neural net and neural nets are always parameterized with a small number of the parameters or the many of them. So this is a function that maps a set of examples into a parameter of a neural network. And then of course, this function being the thing that we don't know how to write, this function itself has a, a set of hyperparameters. You, you, what is the one example of this function? It's SGD. The SGD is going to take as the input a large number of the examples and eventually give us a set of parameters that we can use to implement the neural network and then use that to solve a new instances. And the SGD has number of hyperparameters. We got to choose a learning rate. We often need to decide on the scheduling of the learning rate, which actually comes up with the number of the free parameters that we need to choose. You need to decide on the, let's say, momentum parameter. You need to decide on the weight decay and so on. There are so many hyperparameters. If you decided to use, I don't know, Atom instead of the just a vanilla SGD, you need to think about beta one, beta two, I don't know, they're like beta three, I don't know, I don't know. So, so, so many of them, it's gonna be crazy, right? And then you know, the after training is done, we are going to use the output of the, uh, the parameter to do the uh, class, uh, you know, to classify a new instance, that's the X prime. And then some of this kind of, let's say, um, you know, fuchsia learning has been studied over many years. Like in 2017, there was a concept of, they call prototypical network. It just learns how to extract out this kind of, let's say, embedding module. It learns the embedding function that's going to embed a new set of examples so that they are e easily classified in the test time. 
Another one that is even more popular or the famous, but no one really uses it ever is called MAMO or the model agnostic meta learning. Fascinating concept. What they do is that the MAMO finds the initialization for gradient descent in the test time. So that that initialization leads to a better solution after a small number of the gradient descent steps on a new set of examples. It's a fascinating idea. It really doesn't work well, unfortunately, but it's a great idea there. So these are the uh, feature, let's say future learning algorithms. And then you know, if looking at this, and if you think about it, future learning is exactly the same as just supervised learning. Just that the training examples consist of set of examples and often the size of the set varies from one example to another. What that means is that the, we really need to have the training validation and test set in order for us to determine the hyperparameters here, just like whenever we train any kind of neural network because hyperparameters are not given to us for free. So, we're, uh, and then what that means is that in this kind of fuchsia learning, let's say context, we need to figure out hyper hyperparameters because the hyperparameters are ones that we can, we're going to get out of the, you know, the usual training. So we need a training set, we need a validation for, set for model selection and then testing test set for the reporting. And really like what that means is that the, we cannot simply run fuchsia learning and then say that the well, model selection is going to be done automatically. That doesn't work like that, unfortunately. And then this is inevitable because of the free parameter that we have. So the algorithm has its own free parameters. We cannot do that. Now then you had to, but you know, this was kind of a say 2017, 2018. And then you had to, who cares about these algorithms anymore when we have this, uh, you know, gigantic GPT-3. In fact, this is the excerpt I got from the abstract of the GPT-3 paper, which received the best paper award at the New York 2020. It says that the, well, we show that scaled up language models greatly improves test agnostic fusion performance. GPT-3 is applied without any gradient updates or fine tuning with task and fusion demonstration specific, specified purely via text interaction with the model. This is absolutely fascinating. And then these are the examples I got from the OpenAI's blog. Let's say zero shot learning. Model is going to just predict the answer given only a natural language description of the text. No gradient updates are performed. Something like translate English to French. Cheese, what should be a French word for cheese? It's going to just give us the answer. Yes, exactly. So here comes another zero shot learner here. Yes, in addition to GPT-3. And then one shot. Translate English to French. One example. C order is the Lutre de Mer, and then now cheese. Okay, good answer. Few shot again. Translate English to French. Few examples of this, uh, you know, English French pairs, and then ask the model to translate cheese. It works. It's like magical. This is actually amazing, right? This and then this has become something we call prompt engineering. And then you know, the people started to hire prompt engineers. By the way, do not be a prompt engineer. I think that's actually a dead end job. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. My suggestion is not to do that. That shouldn't be like the, your career aspir aspiration. Absolutely not. But anyway, let's look at what happens. And then after this slide, we're going to go for coffee. So there's a GPT-3. And then let's follow what it means to do the fuchsia learning in this prompt engineering way. Now we have a set of examples right? Few examples, very small number of examples. And then there's a new example that we want GPT-3 to solve. So that is X prime. So that's going to be cheese in the example from earlier. And then this data and the new instance together with the person prompt engineer, they work together to get a prompt or the prefix. And then the prefix corresponds to translate English to French dot dot new, new line C order goes to Lutre de Mer, you know, the peppermint goes to, I don't, I don't even know how to pronounce it anymore. Okay, plush, plush giraffe becomes that. And then now cheese becomes what, right? So that's going to be our prompt. That goes into GPT-3. And then GPT-3 is going to assign the probabilities to the target class tokens because not every token is going to be meaningful. So, you know, prompt engineer is going to decide these are the tokens over which we, uh, we want GPT-3 to compute the probabilities. And then we're going to finally produce the answer based on what was the high score we get from this GPT-3 based on the prefix we got. And then this is prompt engineering. Do you see some issue here? 
there is a huge issue with this approach. Okay, engineer is an issue. Yes, engineer being engineer, prompt engineer and having prompt engineering as a career, that's a huge problem. But aside that, uh, there is another issue. But then that another issue, I guess we're going to talk about it after coffee. I think that makes sense. You know, to leave us on the hang on the cliff for 10 minutes more. Okay, okay. I'll tell you the answer and then I'm going to, I'm going to tell I'm not going to tell you the solution to the answer, but the biggest issue is that there are so many hyperparameters. Task description. Task description is combinatorial. If your prefix is going to be 100 words long, and then let's say vocabulary size was a uh, half a million or the 30,000, is 30,000 to the power of 100. So you need to find the task description that makes sense. And then example presentation. How are you going to present the example? So I don't know if you notice on the right uh, bottom right, you see that they use the you know the equal sign and then small sign right to show that okay that's the or left side hand side is the input right hand side is the output. But what if I use the you know like the tilde or some other sign? Would that have break, break, uh, broken down the whole thing? Maybe maybe not. So how do we actually present the examples? That's a hyperparameter. And then target token set. Who decides that the, which subset of the vocabulary contains the potential answer? Somebody had to choose it. That's a hyperparameter. And number of training examples to present. Because if you go into the appendix of the GPT-3 paper, or actually a lot of, let's say, the examples online these days, we're using not only GPT-3, but GPT-3.5, GPT-4, they actually do tune the number of examples to present for the future learning or the prompt-based future learning. So that's another hyperparameter. And then if you look at, you know, if you try to enumerate it, there's so many hyperparameters. It's actually much worse than you know, the SGD or anything like that. There are so many hyperparameters. But yeah. No, okay, okay. I'll just finish up the final bullet point and then we'll have coffee and then we'll come back and then I'll tell you that there is no solution. But what is different in this case from the conventional future learning is that the as GPT-3 paper and the open AI continues to, let's say, boast, is that the, there's no training validation future task. They just say that, okay, because G these models are so powerful, all we need to do is we just talk to it as if you're talking to another person. So there's no validation or the training future test that we can use to tune these hyperparameters. But you see that this is an issue. There are so many hyperparameters. So then the question is, how insensitive GPT-3 as a future learner is to the choice of the hyperparameters. Not a lot of people turned out to study that. And then the after the coffee, we're going to actually talk about whether it's sensitive or not. Yes. All right, let's have some coffee and come back in. Okay, all right. All right, this one always works with the mostly undergrads at NYU, but okay, here with the PhD students as well. That's good. All right, anyway, welcome back. Uh, we'll continue with the, a bit of a uh, hyperparameter tuning in this kind of future learning. And then later uh, at the end, we're going to talk a bit about you know, the, the idea of the compression and then you know, the, what does it mean for us to you know, measure this kind of generalization. But, you know, let's see. Okay, so we taught, we ended the first part of the this morning's lecture by talking about how prompt engineering should not be your career choice. Uh, that was one of the main lessons. And then the other one is that the, even though we believe or that we feel like you know, these large scale language models that have really, really well been trained. I mean, the OpenAI has been doing an amazing job. Still the few shot oriented you know, kind of prompt based learning does come together with a lot of hyperparameters. And then in fact, the number of the hyperparameters is in fact so many to the, and then also the space of this uh, hyperparameter is extremely large to the point that the, you start wonder if I only have a few examples, is it really reasonable for us to find these hyperparameters correctly? So let's just take as an example, the task description or the example presentation. Task description is a combinatorial space. It's impossibly large, uh, space of the all possible descriptions. How do I know which one is a good task description to use? And in particular, if I only have five examples, does it even make sense to identify a one perfect task description using five examples alone? 
So it's not really about the learning itself. There is a question here, but the hyperparameter tuning, what is the right way to do it? And then what they said is that it's going to be just purely via text interaction. This is awesome. This is the dream of any natural language processing or the, uh, the AI researchers, right? So yeah, I mean, the, how, this is a question. How do we actually prompt these, uh, you know, large scale language models solve the problems as we want them to? And then if you have actually worked with the chat GPT or the GPT-4 or GPT-3.5 using the OpenAI API, you notice that the, although it gets better every month, but it's quite sensitive to how you actually prompt the model. And then that turned out to be a, one of the major issues that we have to keep in our mind. And that's the reason why I'm spending time to, you know, to tell you about this. And then the interesting thing is, and then you know, it was actually about 2021 that we I got really interested in this problem. And then you know, I worked together with Ethan Paris, who is now a, a research scientist at Anthropic back then. And then he was a PhD student with me back then. And then we just looked at some of these papers that followed uh, GPT-3. And then they all use a lot of uh, prompt engineering or the prompt-based learning in order to solve a lot of problems. And it was really interesting. And then you know, the, let's see. So Tom and Manon at all 2021 said that the, we still assume access to a full development set to choose a best masking ratio and checkpoint models. Redfold and Kim at all 2021 said that we repeatedly queried performance on full validation sets to guide the development. Kim and Eisner 2021, which was actually the best short paper from the NACO, said that for gradient training, we test with the model that performs best on the dev set. And then we started to see the pattern. You see the pattern here, right? So they actually often use a full validation set that is aside from the actual few shot training examples that they were using. And then this full validation set, in fact, was a labeled set. And then you start asking the question, wait, hold on, is it really a few shot learning then? What is the definition of fusion learning? I thought we, were, we only had a few examples, but the validation set is gigantic. So I mean, why wouldn't I just use them as a training exam, training set, right? And then we continued like the Shake and Shoes 2021, which was an outstanding long paper from the NACO 2021, said that they, as we consider Fuchsia setting, we assume no access to large development set. We're like, okay, that's great. That actually makes sense. Our choice of hyperparameters is thus based on choices made in previous work and practical considerations. And then those previous work are these, uh, these ones. They all use a large development set. And I was like, hmm, okay. And then the Liscao and Rush 2021, which was another uh, outstanding paper award, and then they said that we use a subset of prompts from the Shake and Shoes 2020B, which is a paper above, right? The first paper. I'm like, okay, hold on. So it turned out that there are a lot of, let's say, cases where people have claimed to do the fuchsia learning with the prompt engineering weren't actually fuchsia learning. Because in their case, they had a small number of the training examples, but that their learner was taking as the input also a large set of the validation examples that were just labeled examples, just like the training examples. So the input was a few training examples plus a lot of validation examples. And then this learner is going to output a model configuration that can handle a new example. And then the unfortunate thing is that the this use of this large amount of the validation examples kind of say, you know, makes it a bit difficult for us to tell how well this uh, future learning was actually happening. So then you at the, so we know the answer. So to, uh, to this question, do we really use only a few examples? And the answer is no, it turned out. Because this prompt engineer was looking at a gigantic amount of the uh, validation set. And then, by the way, so I just want to say that, but still, this is an extremely, extremely exciting thing. In 2014, when we built this kind of a, say, attention-based neural machine translation system for the first time in Montreal, one of the things that we tested just out of fun was to asking our model to translate this source sentence. Unknown, you know, you learned about the UNC token or the you know, out of vocabulary token from Noah yesterday. UNC Korea is a friend of the United States. Can you translate this into French? I was in Montreal, so of course French was the language that we were working with. And then it would actually translate it and then we would actually uh, prevent it from outputting this uh, unknown token, just like you know, what Yejin did with all those neural, you know, like the logic, let's say decoding and so on. And then it translated into uh, South Korea is a friend of the United States. But then when we replace the friend with the enemy and then we ask the model to translate it again, it would actually fill it up with the North Korea, which kind of makes sense. And it was very exciting because you know, it did show that okay, these models actually have amazing amount of the word knowledge that they can use in order to answer many of these questions without too much of difficulties in, let's say, posing the question. So it is still exciting. 
but excitement does not necessarily uh, does not mean that we can be sloppy about doing a hyperparameter tuning unfortunately so we thought okay I thought you had know, to together with my student, uh, uh, former student Ethan Perez, and my former colleague at you know, the that you okay. Let's try to test it in a true fuchsia setup. How sensitive are these language models to the hyperparameter choice? So we're really assuming that we only have a few examples for both hyperparameter selection as well as a train. And then for the hyperparameter selection, we can you know uh, it includes everything, including the prompts as well. And then training is just a forward pass through the language model. So left to right, uh, or the United left to right, or the next word prediction models, right to left is fine as well. And then we, for the evaluation now, we're going to use a large, let's say, held out test set that was not used for a prompt engineering nor the training. So then what do we need? We need a mechanism to select hyperparameters based on these few examples, let's say, call it H. And then we need to have a fuchsia learner F. In our case, it's going to be just a left to right auto regressive language model or the right to left one of some, let's say, uh, monotonic, let's say, language model. And then we need a predictor, again, that's going to be part of the language model. And then how do we know that this whole process worked well or the works well is to compute the expected generalization error over the test set, right? Test examples after finding the hyperparameter hyperparameters using H and then using the hyperparameter and then using the fuchsia learner F and then using the output from the fuchsia learner to do the prediction on those test examples. So you know, this is going to be the, one of the most complicated equation I ever show you uh, this morning, but it's really just saying that we have to do hyperparameter tuning, we have to do the learning, and then we have to do the evaluation and then there's a loss function and then we want to compute it over the test distribution or the held out set. So for true, that's a true fuchsia learning as when the only thing that we have access to is the, the D, the D that consists of a small number of examples. However, this, this, this is not what people have done, had done back then, unfortunately, is that they were actually introducing D prime. There is a very large validation set that is a label set. And then they use that D prime in order to find the hyperparameters and then use the hyper, those hyperparameters in order to uh, do the training using a small number of the examples. So you see small difference there, right? Uh, small difference. So here in the entire thing, there's only one data set D, right? That is used twice. But here there's D, but there's a D prime and the size of the D prime is often much greater than the size of the D. And then the thing is this are almost, so almost fuchsia learning loss. So the risk is going to be almost always smaller than the true risk. So meaning that we are always overestimating how well the model is going to work because this D prime is actually a set of samples drawn from the actual data distribution. So a lot of, let's say, things that you have seen as a success story of the fuchsia learning using prompt engineering turned out to be a bit more, you know, overselling or the overestimation of how well things can work. So to do it more properly, we have to think about what this H, the hyperparameter selection using only small this small amount of data set is uh, should look like, right? How should it be? Because if we had a large data set, D prime, it's very trivial. We simply run, uh, train a model using D and then estimate the loss on the D prime. But in this case, we don't have that large D prime. So then what are the kind of obvious things that people have been doing in particular pre, let's say big data era is that the you know, K fold cross validation. K could very well be just one or you know, the using some kind of minimum description length, or you know, the using all those you know, the information criterion, let's say base information criterion, you know, the, and others. So, but you know, the generally the conclusion wouldn't change. So we stick largely to these two, let's say cross-validation and the MDL based, let's say hyperparameter selector. Although you know, the, uh, we tried a bunch of the others and nothing really changed. And then you know, the, let's just, you know, the, Establish that prompt engineering is super difficult because the space is really, really, really large. And then it's a combinatorial space with a variable length of the variable length. So it's really a, not a difficult, a easy problem. We don't even know how to do the proper optimization there. So, you know, we can experiment it. We're going to still overestimate. We're going to slightly less overestimate, but overestimate by using, let's say, some set of the predefined, let's say, prompts. So we're just, we can just make the problem a bit easier for generally. And then there are, you can imagine that the, when you run this kind of experiments, you know, you need to think about what are the questions that you're answering. And then there were three questions we can ask about this kind of, let's say, hyperparameter tuning in the true fuchsia setup. One is that the, 
if we do the proper hyperparameter tuning, will we be able to find the correct prompt that people found using large validation set? That's the one question. And the second question is that the, regardless of whether we can find the good prompt, at least can we actually get a similar level of the accuracy? These two are slightly different because there are many, there, are, there potentially are many different prompts that are more or less similar in terms of the accuracy. And then the last one is that, okay, so what is this gap? So if you're not, we cannot do as well as the, you know, the uh, using a large validation set, then how, how much are we losing? So let me show you some experiments. I mean, these are very standard thing that people are using about two years ago, probably not anymore these days, uh, but I'll just give you the answers directly. So first, can we, uh, is it possible to find the best prompt? Have we not had access to this large validation set, which is kind of, let's say, ridiculous in general, is that the, no, not really. It turned out the hyperparameter tuning in the future learning is indeed difficult. Less than 30% 30, 30 of the time, you can recover the best prompt using only a few examples rather than you are using a lot of, let's say, validation examples. And unsurprisingly or surprisingly, depending on you know, which side you're sitting on, it's more difficult if the language model is larger. I actually don't have any uh, explanation why, but you know, the, it seems like the reason is that the, it's, uh, there are much more, let's say, plausible pr prompts according to the small number of the examples we have. And then you know, the, it's not really about the training example. You know, the, if, you think, if you think about the future learning, how many examples do you have in your mind? Five, three, 10. So we tried it up until 40, and then the, this conclusion doesn't really change. We didn't do it further because it was actually pretty expensive, but you know, the, yeah, it doesn't really change. So the future learning, if you are really being future learning, finding a good hyperparameter is really difficult. So then the next one you want to test is that the, but you know, as long as it's better than the random choice that is not dependent upon the choice of the, uh, the validation examples or the examples, if, as long as it does better than that, that's fine. But it turned out that this is actually not that not not much of the case. Random hyperparameters tends to work as well as you know the carefully selected hyperparameters if you only have a few examples. So this really tells you a lot about the challenges of the hyperparameter tuning. So using this kind of large scale language models still is problematic if you want to do the proper hyperparameter tuning. And in fact, uh, more than sixty percent of the time, the accuracy turned out to be lower than the average accuracy you you can get by testing out many random hyperparameters to so the random choice of the prompts. And then this, this, this is not just a one data set, you know, it, it happens across all those different data sets as well. But then you have to, of course, you know, the, uh, it's actually, you know, just a random, you know, reasonably typed out prompts are okay. You don't have to find the best prompts, but then you have the, uh, it's often, you know, the, you know, but at least a good sign is that the larger models do tend to give us a better accuracy across board. So in a sense that you know, the, you know, building a larger models tends to help. Now, here's a big confounder here. Larger models tends to be trained better just because of the quirk of the optimization procedure. And then there, you know, these models were not really well controlled in terms of you know, the, how much data was seen, how many optimization steps were taken and so on. So it's a bit difficult to draw this conclusion, but generally a better trained model tends to do better, fortunately. Although we, given a model, finding a good hyperparameter with only a few examples, kind of impossible. And then this actually is not only about the prompt engineering, by the way. So one might say that they will, then we're going to do the gradient-based fine-tuning, and that's going to be less sensitive to the hyperparameters. That turned out, again, not to be the case. You know, I, we tried with the idea, oh, instead of the prompt tuning, we're going to do the fine-tuning based on the gradient-based optimization. That one as well, almost everything that has been reported was overestimating the how well these algorithms were doing because again, they found the hyperparameters based on a large number of the validation examples. And then in fact, if you have a large number of the validation examples, what should, what should you do? Just fold it into the training set. Then suddenly you are not in a, this challenging future learning setup, but you're just in a machine, you know, usual learning setup. And then that's almost always a better thing to do. So 
uh, one lesson I want to point out is that the hyperparameter tuning and evaluation is really, really difficult. And then you know, the, however, the underlying models become better and better, underlying algorithms become better and better. The challenges and then the practice that we have, to, good practice that we need to follow in terms of the hyperparameter tuning and evaluation doesn't really change. We have to be very, very strict about it. And this is the one message that Noah and the Yejin actually gave to you. I wanted to, let's say, deliver yesterday over and over is that the evaluation is really difficult, uh, important. And then at the moment, many of these language models that you are trying out and then trying to see how well they work, we are almost inevitably overestimating how they are how, how well they work because we don't know whether the test examples that you're trying out or the test examples from the benchmarks were not included in the training training set for training these large scale models. And then the overestimation is going to bite us when we try to actually build a system and then deploy it. So before we move on to another topic, the final topic, we had the one thing I want to really say is that the future learning, regardless of how good our language models or the how amazing progress we have made in natural language processing during the past, let's say, two to 10 years, regardless of those advances, is still very, very difficult. If, and then you had the, you can only tell whether it's difficult or not if you follow the good practice. That is that the, you use the correct way to do the hyperparameter tuning with, without introducing extra information. And then if you use the validation, general, uh, check the generalization accuracy very carefully so that the, you only check it using the test examples that were not included in the training set, then we know that it's actually very difficult. Unfortunately, in a lot of cases, these two are not really well uh, you know, like the, um, satisfied to the point that you know, the people tend to overestimate how well these models or the algorithms are doing. So you have to be really careful about it. So then can we actually come up with a better algorithm to do the hyperparameter tuning better? Perhaps you know, we can actually learn from what we were already doing 2017, 18, is that the, if we do the transfer learning, meta learning or whatnot, we should have the validation task and everything well established. And then we try to do the proper, let's say, hyperparameter tuning and evaluation. Or we can probably even build an algorithm that's going to do this kind of, uh, let's say, hyperparameter tuning as in the prompt engineering ourselves. And then this actually also connects to the fact that you have to, uh, to why you know you don't want to have you don't want to be a prompt engineer as your career choice because you know it's going to be either resolved by an automated algorithm or it's never going to be solved because the problem is just too difficult in general. So anyway, so that's a kind of a say challenge and then the importance of the hyperparameter tuning and then how you shouldn't actually overestimate this generalization accuracy, because in real world, there won't be those validation set, large validation set others have prepared for you already. So then you know, we're going to move on to slightly lighter, you know, at the more optimistic topic soon. But you know, before that, is there any questions about this kind of hyperparameter tuning, fuchsia learning and the prompt learning? Okay, we'll start from the front. Correct me if I'm wrong, but did you, so you had a fixed set of fixed length prompts? A uh, fixed set of the variable length prompts. Yes. Okay, but, they, but they didn't change, the prompts themselves didn't change throughout the experiments. No, we didn't change it. Uh, it was a, we chose one of them from this predefined set, right? Using the hyperparameter selection. And then this predefined prompts were actually the prompts that people have used before. So they were already kind of a say filtered in with the validation set. So we are still overestimating here. And the question is gonna be just how many, roughly how many uh, if I recall correctly, it was a bit different for the different data sets, but uh, roughly about 40, 40, oh, wait, I didn't put it, about 40 or so, yes. So dramatically smaller than the actual prompt space, yes. Um, so my question relates to the term fuchsia learning, and maybe because mm -hmm. the term Q is also maybe the study, which might be like part of the problem where people tend to use different amounts of examples, right? Mm -hmm. So when I talk to people about the difference maybe between future learning and even fine tuning, mm -hmm. people can very out of order these days. Because yep. as you said, people use like maybe two examples, but maybe a hundred or something else. Yep. Which is like a amount of data we could use for fine tuning. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, what would you consider considered to be huge learning? Like, in rough numbers maybe mm -hmm. and how do we actually like describe the um 
the area between fuchsia learning and fine tuning? Is there like such a curve, or is it? Yeah. Yeah, it's very fuzzy. That's a good question. So the question is, you know, the, when we say fuchsia learning, how many is few, right? I mean, okay, so is it one, two, three, four? Of course, uh, fuchsia learning is a kind of a say, you know, like the fuzzy high-level concept. But so the I think the right way to think about it is that the it is more about kind of a say meta learning. So where we are training a model that's going to solve the problem of learning, and then in doing so we can often only afford to train this learner on a uh, learner that works on a small number of the data points, because if it's too large, you know, in order to do this kind of uh, train this fuchsia learner, we need the uh, training examples of this fuchsia tasks, fuchsia tasks. And then often we cannot really afford to create too many of them. And then, so that's the reason why the few is more like the computational constraints that we put ourselves, you know, computation or the resource constraint. So this few can be actually varies a lot. And then the another thing is that the number of the data points itself is actually not that important. Because you know, you, we can have, let's say, almost exactly the same copy with the slight variations and a lot of them, but that's going to be essentially the same as having just a one copy. And I'm going to actually talk about this kind of compression aspect in the rest of the lecture. Another question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, I just want to argue that if I have this validation set, which follows the same distribution of the data, I'm trying to find out in the wild when I deploy my model, wouldn't that be the actual uh, performance mm -hmm. of the model if I use this validation and I run the random set, then on the wild it's going to be more than the same distribution? What would it be overestimated? Ah, yes. So the overestimation comes from this, how to choose the hyperparameter. So the overestimation comes from the fact that if we are using D prime, that is not available in the real deployment scenario. So the fuchsia learning is where we get this kind of, we find these hyperparameters and then later, uh, later on, it's going to be, uh, you know, in the test time, we are actually given this D not D prime, and then we have to solve this problem from scratch, that's fuchsia learning. We're not given D prime. But then you have to, when people report how well their algorithm overall, that includes the G, F, and H, all of these, they use D prime and thereby they overestimate things. Now, what would be the more realistic one if they want to do that? They should actually include this D prime also outside when, you, when they do the F. Then that's not anymore like fuchsia. Fuchsia that's in the few examples, but it's just a learning with a lot of let's say data points. Then that will be the kind of say another let's say overestimation of the fuchsia learning, but just not saying that okay, that's not the fuchsia learning, but that's the best we can do if we had a lot of data points. So in fact, that one would be more interesting to know. But yeah, you know, not a lot of people report that one. Is any other questions? Okay. Uh, okay. So the well, we'll go from the front. Okay. So what? Which uh, yeah, okay, hold on, let's see. This one, here, next one. Next one? Oh yeah, yeah, Henry. Okay, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, so the uh, so if you look at it, okay, our choice of the hyperparameters is thus based on choices made in previous work and practical considerations, and then these previous work are actually these papers, and then in these papers you said okay they have used the full development set and full validation set to guide the development, and then found all those hyperparameters based on that. So, you know, it's just, I'm saying that, you know, the, essentially this, so up to this point is exactly the correct thing, but because they used the prompts or some of the hyperparameters from the previous work, which looked at actually the full development set, they were indirectly already choosing those hyperparameters using the full validation set. Yes, but you consider the architecture of the model. Mm -hmm. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, all those things are all overestimation. Actually, the most of the tested, so the you know most of the you know all of us are kind of guilty at some point, and then probably you know, some of us are uh, some of us continue to do a uh, research. But is that the, we are not supposed to use a tested accuracy at all in any kind of development. But then you have to, that's not the case, right? So we check the tested accuracy, we look at the tested accuracy of the other papers, and then you have to only write a paper if the tested accuracy is higher, not when the validation accuracy is higher, and then report you have to how well the test accuracy is. So yeah, those are all overestimation. Yeah, you're correct. Are actually using this, they are not using like just the wrong endpoints there. Yes. They have like a short dialogue mm -hmm. sequence. At the end, it usually gives you a better response. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, like, why does it work? Does like, the dialogue become just the prompt? Or... Yeah, yeah. So, uh, in fact, uh, yes. So you can imagine that the, instead of doing this kind of prompting, you can just use these as examples, supervised pair, right? The instruction and then some instance and then you have to answer, right? And then you can fine tune the whole thing. That's perfectly fine. But exactly the same thing applies because often the instruction set that you can collect tends to be limited if you're going to collect it really carefully with the human annotations and whatnot. But then you at the with the limited number of the instruction examples you have, what is the right way to do the hyperparameter tuning in order to find the right hyperparameters for the optimizer? That's actually you know, at the, still the same kind of problem. So and then you at the, you have to be very careful not to you know, at the overestimate these you know, at the uh, accuracies. All right. Oh yeah. Um, okay. One last one. Yes. Uh, does it make sense to solve the computer problem? Uh, obviously, it wouldn't be too short learning, but solving the computer problem like by optimizing using the computer space of the value instead of and then trying to, to truncate to. Yeah, so the question is that the if the problem is that the, the prompt space is too large or the too, you know, like the difficult to do the optimization over, can we just do it in a, uh, you know, the continuous optimization? So the answer is yes. Uh, some of these algorithms are indeed doing something similar, but then the again, Continuous uh, optimi optimization, continuous space optimization, and discrete space, all of them come together with the hyperparameters that we have to somehow find. And then you know, it's not that trivial. Yes. I mean, it's, I mean, it's fine. You know, we can find them, but you know, we just have to be very you know, careful about how we find them and how we report the accuracies we will get from the hyperparameters that have been found. We don't want to overestimate them, right? That's important. Yes. But anyway, so the uh, the lesson here, evaluation is difficult. We have to be super careful. So evaluating the generalization capability. And the second is that the, for hyperparameter tuning, we have to be really careful about what we are using to do the hyperparameter tuning. Yes. But that's it. Okay, that's a bit, you know, uh, that was a bit of a somber and then you had the set kind of the say part of you know, what we do these days. But that's perfectly fine. I mean, the, we're, let's talk about something that is less realistic now. But then you know, the uh, could be more fun if you're a bit more you know, the uh, mess savvy. Is that the let's just move on and then let's zoom out a bit and then see you know, the why are these language models work well? What are they doing? And then you know, the, if you think about it, it's actually awesome what these models can do. These you know, the left to right next word prediction models because if you think about what those fuchsia learning using a prompt engineering does. It is, in fact, it means that the, our language model has learned an algorithm, learn a learning algorithm on its own. Literally, it looks at some of the examples and it updates its own hidden state. And then the hidden state reflects how the problem is going to be solved. And then that's a learning algorithm. So it's learned an algorithm. How did it do it? What does it mean? What does it mean to learn an algorithm? Because from our uh, learn and implement an algorithm, in our mind, implementing an algorithm is programming. How does it connect to then machine learning? And then is there any way to connect these two concepts? And then what is the right way to connect those two concepts? And then this one is not going to be anything practical, but I think this view is going to help you think about why are these reason language models are able to solve so many different problems based on how we actually work with them. 
to think about it, uh, we need to think about the connection between programming, compression, and machine learning or learning. And then it turned out that the programming and pre prediction are essentially the same problem. And then they can be connected via the problem of the compression. And I'll go through it one step at a time. So let's say we have two, two people. A Bob is a lazy user and the Elvis is a very smart programmer. And then Bob being so lazy, Bob needs to count number of the ones in a binary sequence quite often. And every time he needs to do it, he's going to ask Alice because he knows that the Alice is smart. Alice can count the ones really well. So every time there's a sequence he needs to count the ones of, he's going to ask Alice. Alice is going to answer with the number of the ones in the sequence. How many ones are there? Alice is going to answer three. How many ones are there? Five. How many ones are there? Seven, nonstop. But Alice is smart. Alice is a smart programmer. What do she do? She would actually just write a program, a counting program, and then send Bob, here's a counting program. Don't talk to me ever. Just run it on your laptop, right? Because Alice is smart and Bob is lazy. So Alice is going to write a program and then send it to Bob. So that from there on, Bob is going to simply run the program whenever there is a sequence that he needs to count the ones of. So what that means is that the L is somehow compressed huge amount of data into a fixed number of bits. So before, every time Bob asked Alice some question, Alice had to send some number of bits that uh, represent the answer every time there is one. So it's a nonstop stream of answers. So that's a huge amount of data Alice is sending back to Bob. But now, since Alice wrote a program, counting program, and then send the program to Bob, Alice all Alice need to do is to send a finite number of bits once and that's it. So it's like the amazing way to compress the amount of data that Alice had to send to Bob by just writing a program. And it's much more efficient for Alice. And then what this means, and then you have to, we can count the number of bits we need. You know, if you have a program that is, a, you know, like the some length, then we can just look at the log two of that length of the program. That's the number of bits we need in order to send it to Bob. In fact, that's the maximum number of bits. You know, we can often do it better. We will talk about that a bit later. So what that means is that the programming turned out to be just a compression. It's like the amazing way to do the compression, right? And then you have to, now we can think about, okay, how well can we do it? If we could program really well, if I were a smart programmer, how much compression can we do corresponds now to computing the shortest program, the length of the shortest program. And then that's called the Kolmogorov of complexity. So the theoretically, Alice goal or all of your goal is to minimize the length of the program whenever you program something, uh, you, you code something because that is the goal. So instead of talking to the, your client every time they come to you, you want to write a program that's going to automatically answer everything and then make it as short as possible and then send it to the client. That's the optimal thing you can do. Right? Unfortunately, the Kolmogorov complexity is not computable. Just like a lot of things in computer science, actually, just like most of the things in computer science, this is not computable. That's not that great. And then the reason is because of the contradiction is you know, the, the halting problem. Essentially, if we can compute the Kolmogorov complexity exactly without any constraint, that means that we can solve the halting problem, but we know that the halting problem cannot be solved again, unless we put some kind of constraint as in like, oh, the duration over which the program can run has to be limited or finite or something like that. So it turned out that we can really compute it, but we still care about it because the program length is not about coming up with the actual program, but it's about the compression. So the programming, is compression. So then you have to, what we do is that the, essentially what Alice is doing is that instead of giving all those answers, Alice is compressing all these things and then send a compressed number of the bits to the Bob together with the decompression algorithm. And then the number of bits that Alice originally would have sent was the N is the number of the examples. So N times the log two of the L where the L is going to be the, let's say the pre precision or the number of bits Alice used to, let's say, encode this integer. But now Alice only sends the constant, uh, the fixed number of the bits for decompression plus the K times N, where the K is going to be much smaller than the log two of the L. So let's do it. If I had a decompressor, Bob is going to 
look at, okay, so here's a sequence that I want to do the counting of. And then this goes in and then, oops, and then Alice is going to send a small number of bits so that the, this decompressor works as a counting example. And then this decompressor is going to give, a, give, a, give, back, give back, back the correct answer by using only the K bits. Now, what does that mean? If we have the perfect program, if you could write the perfect program, this K is zero. So Alice doesn't pay anything for every answer that she, she sends back to Bob. This is the perfect compression. That's the perfect program. Unfortunately, we don't know how to write such a program, almost always. So sorting, we know how to do that. Yeah, the few things we can know how to do that, but let's think about self-driving car. We don't know how to program code a self-driving car. That's what everyone claims that they can do within three years, but no one has ever done that so far. And that's the reason why there has to always be that K. That is that the, we cannot really write a pro perfect program so we're going to just do the compression as much as we can, but not to the point that the number of the bits becomes just finite and fixed constant. And then you have the now, let's say I want to compress it really well. What is the best way to compress? Let's think about uh, some simple, let's say thought experiment. Let's say I, you're going to ask me a question and I need to send you the answer. And then the answer can be one of the four answers. So it's a multiple choice. Say, you know, I don't know you, you don't know me. So you have no idea what the answer is going to be or the answer that I'm going to send you. So your guess of the answer that you're, uh, I'm going to send you is just uniform. It can be 25%, one, 25%, two, 25%, three, 25%, four. Then, then the number of the bits that I need to, uh, we need to use in order for me to send you the answer is you know, the on expectation, 1.5 bits. It's just essentially the low, uh, you know, the, you, you see the computation there. So it's going to be 25% times one, 25% one, 25% two bits and 25% two bits because zero, you know, if I have a four of them, you know, I need a two bits to code them. But let's say we became friends. We became friends. So you can start actually guessing what I think because we are good friends. You know that you're okay. Out of four possible things that I can say, you know me well to the point that the, you can guess that there are only two are plausible. Then the number of bits we need on expectation is so much lower because you know what I'm going to say. Let's push it further. We've become best friends forever, BFF. You know exactly what I'm going to say, perplexity one, right? Then I don't need to say anything because you already know what I'm going to say. And number of the bits that I need to send you is zero. So what that means is that the if, so in other words, we've become best friends forever. So you can predict what I'm going to say so perfectly to the point that the number of bits that I send you is zero. So if you can predict what, what's going to happen, you don't need to pay the bits in order to know what's actually going to happen. So in other words, if we can make rough but correct prediction, we can reduce the number of bits on average meaning that the prediction is compression. The best way to compress is to predict perfectly what's going to happen. Then you don't need to use any bits. So then you're like, okay, so what was the programming? Programming was our perfect way to do the compression, compressing the infinite number of the bits into finite number of constant number of bits. And then, how, and then what is the prediction? Prediction turned out to be our best bet to compress as much as we can. And then what that means is that in fact, prediction is precisely what we mean by programming. So what would Alice do? Alice is going to look at the first few questions that Bob has sent her and then look at the answers, trying to use machine learning to build a predictive model of what the answer should be. And then based on that one, Alice can compress all the future answers as much as she can, and then send Bob the predictive model along with this compressed data points. If the prediction model was perfect so that the perplexity was just one, so every time you can guess the correct answer perfectly, Alice, all Alice needs to do is to send the predictive model only, nothing else. Because from there on, Bob can just run the prediction and then that's it. So it turned out that the learning in machine learning is identical to programming. And then if I have a good, let's say, um, 
And then you have the, the number of the bits that I save is going to be lower or the higher if the model generalizes better. Because if the prediction is incorrect, then Alice needs to tell Bob a lot more bits to correct that issue. But if the this predictive model is always correct, then it's you know it almost no bits needs to be used. And then this is the reason why all the uh, next token prediction or next word prediction is in fact solve learning all these algorithms because we turned out it turned out that we actually train a model to do the programming. It's predicting what's happening next. So that's how the prediction and predi programming are in fact just the two sides of the same coin and that the coin turned out to be the compression. And then that's the reason why these unsupervised learners that we have turn end up being actually a program that we have learned. Now they are not perfect, but they tend to solve a lot of problems to a very high degree of accuracy because they are amazing predictive models. So then you have to, we can now use this concept to do a bit of an analysis of the data as well. And that's an interesting thing. You know, programming was good. Programming is predictive modeling. And then using a predictive modeling, we can actually analyze the data as well. And then one example I have is that the, I can actually skip this part, but you know, the idea is that the, for instance, sometimes you know, the people tell you that the, well, here's an amazing machine learning algorithm that's going to solve this super challenging problem. How do you know that this problem is challenging? How do you know that that algorithm works? What everyone is going to do is that they will hold on. Here's a challenging problem. Let's make a large training set, large validation set, large test set, and then just report the test set accuracy. Now, is that the best we can do? It turned out that's not necessarily the case. So although you know, we often learn in the machine learning 101, like the first thing, we split them into the training test, validation and test, and then we use a test set to report how well the model works. But is it really the thing that we can rely on that heavily? It turned out that that's not the case, but if you use this connection between the programming and compression, we can actually do the val uh, evaluation much better. I'll take as an example, this multi-hop QA. So nowadays, no one cares about it because you, know, you just go to ChatGPT and then ask a question with the, you know, the, what was the chain of thought prompting and it's going to actually give you all those hops and the answers. So you know, the, no one really is worried too much about the multi of question answering anymore. But until two years ago, three years ago, it was like the big thing, right? And then you know, the multi of QA according to Yang et al. 2018 is uh, testing QA's ability to perform multi hop reasoning where the system has to reason with the information taken from more than one documents to arrive at the answer. So as an example is that the, well, we have the paragraph eight that says that the Marine Tactical Air Command Squadron 28 is a United States Marine Corps Aviation Command and Control Unit based at Marine Corps a Air Station Cherry Point. Paragraph B, Marine Corps Air Station Cherry Point is a United States Marine Corps airfield located in Havelock, 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 North Carolina, USA. Now question is, what city is the Marine Air Control Group 28 located in? The answer is Havelock, North Carolina. But in order to get there, the model needs to make two hops. One hop, read the paragraph A, trying to figure out um, which, let's say, air station the Marine Air Control Group 21 is in. And then read the paragraph B, trying to figure out which city that uh, air station Cherry Point is. So step one, step two is what they meant by the multi-hop QA. And then the what is implicitly being said here is that the if we could answer these two sub questions well, we'll be able to answer the original question really, really well. That's the, what is implicit here. But then, you know, you start asking questions, oh, hold on. What if the step one was that the, in which cities are US Marine Corps airfield uh, located? And then it's going to be a list that contains the Havelock, North Carolina. And then step two, in which base is the Marine Air Control Group 21 station? And then Marine Corps Air Station Cherry Point. And then step three, which among the cities from the step one is Marine Corps Air Station Cherry Point located? Have on North Carolina. This is another way to solve the problem. You see, it took three steps. And another step is that the, why can't I just solve it immediately without the multiple hops? So the question is that the, when you say multi, multi of QA, how do you know that it's actually multi of QA? What's the definition of multi of QA? Just like the, what's the definition of the future learning? Where's the, Threshold, right? In the multi of QA, how do I know that I need a multiple hops in order to answer the question? No one actually 
no. So the, no one actually told us you know, how to do that. And then you know, it actually is not trivial because of the many reasons, but one of them is that the common sense may obviate the need for the multiple reasoning, right? So some might say that the will is very common sense to know that the uh, you know, Cherry Point Station uh, air, airfield is in Havelock, North Carolina, perhaps. As you know, we learned from the Yejin yesterday, what is common sense? It's really difficult to tell, right? Or maybe there are many other ways to answer the same multiple questions. So anyway, so it's really difficult to tell what kind of, pro uh, when the problem is given and the data is given together, what are needed to solve the problem? We really don't know, right? But then you know, the, it turned out that looking at it from this kind of compression perspective helps us figure out uh, the answer to this, this kind of question. What are needed? So then in multi of QA, what we are saying is that the, we can answer the question, original question X better if we actually have the answers to the intermediate questions that are generated features. So we have the X, but we are building a QA model that takes not only as the input X, but the answers to the sub questions. And then it's going to answer, uh, it, it will be able to answer the X better. That's the idea. But how do we know that? So the difference is this. In one case, we give the question directly, and then this question answering model G0 is going to output the answer directly. The other case, we have the input. Input is going to be concatenated with the output from some subroutine, that is the sub question answering module. And then the concatenated input is going to go into the question answering model G1, and G1 outputs the answer Y. So these two are there. And then we want to know, in fact, the, if the right-hand side version is better than the left-hand side version. In other words, if the left-hand side version does worse than the right-hand side version, then we can say that the well, this subroutine was useful. And then that's what everyone does is that the well, you know, the, we made this elaborate new neural network that is able to solve this multi of QA better. And then what they do is that they just report the tested accuracy and then say that, well, here's a higher tested accuracy. So this must work better than the left-hand side one, the simpler one. But then is that really true? Is that the right way to measure which one is doing better? It turned out that that's not really true. And that we have to think about the length of the programs. So if the length, uh, so if the length of the program G0, the minimal length of the program G0, is greater than the minimum length of the program G1, then we can tell that the subroutine F is actually useful. Because, why is that? Because if the length of the program of the G1, so let's go back here. If the program length of this one is greater than G0, then what we can, in particular, if the program length of G1 plus program length of the F, is greater greater than uh, greater than program length of the G zero. Then we will just go for this one. There's no way to no reason to use that, right? This is a better program. As we said, what is the optimal program? Shortest program. So what that means is that the it's not enough to simply look at the tested accuracy on a small number of the test examples, but we have to look at the actual length of the models that we get. So if the length of the G zero is smaller than G one. Uh, we need to remove the F and then you have to re-implement it, what the F does, that's going to increase the length of the G0 so that the, we know that the okay, F is needed. If the length of the G0 and length of the G1 is same, then we would, what that means is the F could, that the subroutine F could be absorbed into G and then it did not have to be done separately. If the G0's length is greater than G1, then F is really necessary. So without F, we couldn't actually solve the problem. Essentially, that's what, we, what it tells us. So then what we want is that what, how we can actually tell whether these kind of features are important is to implement the version without using the feature as well as we can, and then implement a version that uses a feature as well as we can, and then see if the version that doesn't use the feature is longer. Because the longer programs are the worst programs in our kind of, let's say, mindset at the moment. Now, unfortunately, uh, we don't know how to compute that. Kolmogorov complexity is not computable unless the, we limit the class of the problems, uh, the programs that we use. And also we actually often don't know how to program it. We don't know how to program a QA systems. 
except for in a very narrow scenario. No one can do that, right? So, I mean, that's what everyone was doing in the 80s with the expert system. You had all those, uh, you know, the, um, you know I, the knowledge pieces and then let the inference algorithm run it. And then, you know, that's what we, everyone thought that that's how the QA was going to be solved. It has not been solved. So we don't know how to program it yet. So instead, what we can now do is that the, we don't know how to program it. Then we always look at the other side of the coin. There is a machine learning. We're going to learn this. So instead of looking at the actual program length, we're going to look at the, how well these models are predicting the answer because the prediction is compression, higher the pre uh, predictive accuracy, the lower, uh, higher the compression rate. So we, we can now get the sense of how well we can do. So instead of now Kolmogorov complexity, which told us about the length of the minimum program, we look at the minimum description length. Given the data, what is the minimum description length, uh, minimum number of bits we need in order to compress this data directly? I'm going to, uh, there's a catch, but, and then you at the, instead of the program, uh, I'll get to that one. And then instead of programming, we do learning. That learns the predictive model because these two are all exchangeable, right? Interchange, uh, interchangeable. Unfortunately, minimum description length is Kolmogorov complexity, so it's not computable. But then you know, what we do is that instead we approximate the minimum description length by limiting the compression algorithm space that is a hypothesis space. Now, we could have done that with by limiting the class of the programs as well. But then the thing is, limiting the class of program and doing the programming within the limited class of the program is kind of a really, really difficult. What, what does that even mean, right? What does it mean to limit the class of the program space when we do the programming? It's kind of difficult, but you know, in learning, it's very natural because that's the first thing we do whenever we build a machine learning algorithm is to define the hypothesis space, some hypothesis space within which we're going to find the solutions to our program. And then we use learning to find this best algorithm within the hypothesis set. That's what we're going to do. And then now here comes the interesting thing is that even with this, it's really difficult to compute the minimum description length unless we have a good learning algorithm. And it turned out that the deep learning really helps us. The older, let's say, techniques that you have learned, the back propagation using SGD and then you know, the how to build a neural net is a great way to do learning. So we can approximate the minimum description length really well these days. And if you think about the de description length of the data after training is done, it consists of two things. One is the size of the model that you have trained because you need to send that one. That's a number of bits. And then second is the number of bits we need to disambiguate the answer for each and every examples we have. Now, the second, sec, let's talk about the second term first. Second term is about the how well we can predict the answer. If we can predict the answer well, the number of bits we need to pay is really low. And then with the deep learning and then all these machine learning techniques, the second term is extremely low because we can predict it so well. Unfortunately, we're completely doomed because of the first term. There is a size of the model. So if you train, if you have a language model that has about 7 billion parameters nowadays, the modern one, then you need, uh, if you save the, just a model parameters and the network architecture, that alone is going to be several tens of gigabytes. So that kind of, let's say, kills the whole purpose of, let's say, compression here. Even if your prediction is almost perfect, that one is going to kill the whole thing because of the over-parametrization and then also due to the non-parametric nature because our model size actually grows with the data set size. So it kind of, let's say, kills everything. But then it turned out that we can do much better. We can do much better by uh, using the idea of the online coding or some call it prequel coding as well, prequential coding. Yes, and then the what you can do is that the, instead of sending the model themselves, what if we actually send the algorithm, learning algorithm? And learning algorithm tends to be much smaller in our case. SGD, like literally you can write SGD if you are careful and the back propagation in a small number of bits. And then that number of the bits is going to be so much smaller than the number of bits you, you need in order to encode any reasonable size neural network. Like the 7 billion parameter model is not even a large model anymore because you know, they, they have like, oh, is it like the OpenAI GPT-4 is like four, uh, eight times the 200, I don't know, like the billion parameters or something like that. I don't know, that's like they completely uh, you know, outwardly, but anyway. And then we'll compare even the 7 billion primary model to save it, that's like 20 to 30 gigabytes of the uh, space you need. That's so much greater than 
all the software you would need to train the model. You're going to count the Linux kernel, you're going to count the CUDA driver and all those things. And still it's not going to be like 30 gigabytes or anything like that. So we're going to send the algorithm itself and then trying to build up this kind of, let's say, uh, estimate the minimum description length. And then this is where the, again, the idea of the compression and the information theory and programming all kind of, let's say, collapse onto each other here. Now, how do we do that? Let's say we again have a smart programmer Alice, and then you're at the lazy user Bob. And then what we're going to do is at the, at the beginning, Alice is going to send the learning algorithm itself and the pseudo random number generator and the initial seed to Bob. So they are fully synchronized. And then Bob is going to send all the questions in advance to the Alice. So everything is fully synchronized. What Alice is going to do is that the Alice is going to send a very small number of the answers initially to Bob. And then both Bob and Alice will train the first neural net using the same learning algorithm, using the first set of the data points for which they both have the answers. And then we, because everything is synchronized, they have two models that are completely identical. And then using that, now Alice can send the next batch of answers. And then they are compressed already using the same, let's say, uh, model they have. And then you know, Alice doesn't have to send the model because Bob has exactly same copy of the model. And then using this, they're going to train the second model. And then using that, to, uh, Alice is going to send not the third batch of the answers and then continue on and on until Alice sends all the answers to Bob. And then in, doing, in this process, nothing about the model's parameters were sent. So we can save all those bits. Only thing we had to do was to synchronize everything at the very beginning. And then this is the idea of the online coding. And then now what that means is that the, we can now use this idea of the online coding and powerful deep learning to approximate the upper bound to the minimum description length that is extremely tight and use that idea to tell whether some features are necessary or not to solve the problem. And then this is slightly different from the tested accuracy because the tested accuracy is a lousy metric because test accuracy gives us this value. And then this value is not meaningful because mo most of the, let's say this, this uh, approximation to description length is going to be dominated by the size of the model. But the size of the models are all kind of let's say, pretty gigantic. So the often what you see as the difference in the tested accuracy, and then based off of which a lot of people make a conclusion, is incorrect because their models have a different sizes. And then their model sizes, the difference in their model sizes will actually dominate in this minimum description length. So we can't really tell which one is actually doing better in terms of the generalization. Instead, what we can do is we can use the online learning to compute this much tighter minimum description length that is free of the model sizes. It is still dependent on the learning algorithm size, but the learning algorithms tends to be much smaller in terms of the size. And then we can now draw a much better conclusion, whether one algorithm is better than the other or one, way, one representation is better than the other. And then this actually turned out to be really important and good, let's say, way to approach it. Unfortunately, there are yet another set of the hyperparameters that are involved here. One is that, okay, the ordering of the data points, because in online learning, we're training the model little by little sequentially. So how do we actually decide what is the correct ordering of the, uh, the data points? Now, fortunately, due to our usual assumption of the IID, so the, you know, independent and identically distributed samples. So we can just use any kind of permutation, but it's a good idea to try several times and then look at the average of the estimated MDL. And then second thing is that the, uh, which model do we use, right? So the deep learning itself has its own hyperparameters, like the network architecture and so on. How do we choose that? It turned out that we can just do the random search and then pay for the number of the configurations that we have tried log two of that bits, but that turned out that tends to be often much smaller. So it's actually perfectly fine to do so. And then it turned out that the, this kind of thing really tells us exactly whether the features are necessary or not. So this is a clever data set. It's a very you know, toy synthetic data for the visual, let's say question answering. And then what we see is that the, this 
MDL that is estimated using the online coding. And then we call this whole procedure a uh, recent and data analysis just because a recent and was the father of the, uh, the MDL and so on. And also he's, he's, uh, he's, he was from Finland and then I studied there as well. So we just decided to use uh, some Finns name there. And then what we, what we do see is that the, exactly if we have the feature augmented features that are known to be important because this is a whole synthetic data set, we, uh, people created themselves. We see that the MDL drops almost perfectly as anticipated. So for the integer comparison, knowing the one of the integers is always helpful, knowing two even more so. Attribute contribution, you actually need to know both of them. Otherwise, it doesn't really help. And then same property as you almost doesn't actually get the sense because just detecting what kind of the objects are there and what kind of object attributes they have tends to be very simple. And then we tried it on the multi-hop QA. Are the multiple hops actually needed? It turned out that the answer is yes, if you train everything from scratch. But what happens if you uh, use a pre-trained model, which is actually much more interesting is on the right-hand side, is that the, unless the correct answer, sub-answers sub were given, the advantage of using these sub-question and answers is almost gone. Because by this kind of large-scale pre-training, these models have already learned how to answer these sub-questions uh, sub almost perfectly by looking at a large amount of the unlabeled examples. And then it really gives us a lot of, let's say, confidence that, okay, we can use this connection between the compression and programming and the prediction in order to analyze the data and the problems themselves much better than before. And then one of the reasons why we know is that the, in NLP, there is a, it's almost like a disease. Every year, there will be at least two papers, one of which claims that the word order doesn't matter for text classification. And then the other one is going to say that the word order matters for text classification. That has been happening every year. Ridiculous, right? <laughs> why? I mean, what is the answer? And then why does the answer flip every year? So it turned out that one of the major reasons why that has been happening is they've been relying too much on a small test set, uh, small test sets. So the variance has been really large. And then the comparison has been essentially dominated by the model sizes or all the factors that are not really necessary. So if you run this online coding base as a recent data analysis, then what you see is that the, across all these different tasks that people have been using to draw you know, those two opposing or contradictory conclusions are very well resolved in a sense that the, the word order actually does matter almost always, and then there is an important information, but just a degree to which they matter changes across the data set. But if you use just a tested accuracy with a small number of the test examples, what you end up with is that the, the variance is really large and then you cannot actually draw any conclusion about whether the word order helps or not. So really like the, this way of thinking about it from the compression really gets us a much firm and then, you know, a solid conclusion about the problem itself and the data itself. And then, you know, we tried it for the, those, you know, the impact of the gendered word, impact of the natural language explanation, impact of the word level rationals. And then we could actually draw a much kind of cleaner and then solid conclusions there. By the way, so this is, of course, what people have been doing, but, you know, we, you know, we as a community tend to have a very short attention span and a very short term memory. So, you know, the, this kind of use of the MDL has been used for the model analysis. And then you can use this kind of idea to probe the model. But of course, you know, the model probing often suffers from the variance induced by a small probing set. And then you know, this, this can be th thought of as a more quantitative way to analyze and understand the data sets. And this can actually um, augment many of the existing, let's say, qualitative way to analyze and you know, the document these data sets as well. So what really we're getting here is that the at the end of the day, you know, every, we are we are being very uh, surprised and then excited by the possibility of this language model solving so many difficult problems that we thought would not have been possible. And then you know, at the, it turned out that we can actually discuss, uh, I think a lot about why that happens by relying on the, some of the very old concepts. It's kind of a say, Kolmogor of complexity is from 50s, 60s probably, 60s. Um, minimum description length from 80s. 
And then a lot of this idea of the compression versus prediction is from the closed channel, so the 40s. And then these actually concepts when connected with each other really get, tells us about you know, the, why is prediction-based model somehow learn to solve these problems so, so well. And then because it turned out that the prediction is essentially you know, the learning to program as well. And then you know, the, this also allows us to do a much thorough let's say, analysis of the data set as well as the problems that we are solving. And also it actually tells us why hyperparameter tuning in the future learning is kind of almost impossible because when we have like five examples or so. And then it also tells us what is the only way forward in that direction and the only way for it is to make the underlying predictive model so much better so that the, whatever we put in, this model is going to give us a very robust prediction of what's going to happen in the next time step, because that's the only way for us to get a very low, uh, high rate of the compression, which is a better prediction, and then which is also a way for us to get to the better robustness there. So... Yeah, and then you know, that actually kind of as it concludes what I have prepared for you know this morning's lectures. So we covered everything from you know, the what is modern NLP, not the old school NLP, and we talked about how this kind of as a getting the using a distribution hypothesis is the key to building up transformers, word vectors, you know the all these generators and whatnot. And then we talked about the importance of the hyperparameter tuning and the evaluation or the proper ways to do so. And then we learned that if we don't do it properly, we are going to overestimate how well these systems are working. And the overestimation doesn't hurt for your publication record, but overestimation hurts when you actually build a system that you're going to deploy. So it's really important. And then finally, we talked about, okay, what are the kind of one avenue that we can pursue in order to understand better what these modern NLP systems do and then you have to why they work really well. And then for that, that avenue that we pursued was, okay, making a connection between compression, programming, uh, learning our prediction and the programming via the idea of the compression. And then you know, we learned about, you know, this really gives us a good sense of what is going on underlying all these models and as well as the data sets and problems as well. Now let's try to get some questions and then try to, you know, try to see if I can answer some of them. All right, any questions from the audience? Of course, the, old, the whole thing, yes. Okay, oh, it's okay. Back there all the way, yeah. Hmm. Thank you, Jesus. Um, yeah, yeah, I will start. Um, yeah, um, maybe this might be too basic and maybe it's asking you to repeat too many things, but why why do we care how large the model is or how large the program is? At, at some intuitive level, I don't understand it. To, to me, like the test set accuracy is what we care about when deploying a model. Mm. I understand, okay, it's 40 gigabytes, but whatever, that will be irrelevant soon. Uh -huh. It already is like at, at, at you know companies, that's not really a limiting issue. Mm. Um, if I have if I have a human that's small and can solve the tasks okay, but then I have a computer that's like a size of a room but can be a thousand times more accurate, I'm gonna choose the bigger model. I, that doesn't matter what the size mm -hmm. difference is. So what am I missing? Yes, uh, so what is missing is essentially I wasn't I, I didn't actually explain it well enough. So <laughs> but let's let's go back a bit. So the why do we care about so okay so how did we start here is that the we wanted to talk about what it means to write the perfect program and then the perfect program in this definition is the best compression so how to compress the number of bits that we need to send optimally if we can compress it well that's equivalent to writing the perfect program that's how we started it so what that means is that the eventually writing a perfect problem is identical to compressing the entire data or, yeah, the, so, or the data you can find. So now, I get that, yeah, but, but yep. why do we care about that? Yep. Why, why is that important as opposed to... Because our, we want to write the perfect program. Why? <laughs> oh, I mean, the, if you don't want to write a good program, that's actually fine. But then you have to, as you said, you said that a thousand times accurate, then that would be great. Yeah. So that, that high accuracy is writing the perfect program. 
No, well, no. You the way you presented it, it's not. It, it seems to mm -hmm. trade off against. Well, not then doesn't not necessarily trade off, but not mm -hmm. necessarily be connected to each other. Oh well, it is very connected here, as you can see. What happens is that the so let's fr start from here. So, what is what is the best way to what is what does it mean to write the best program? It is to write a program so that the user does not have to query at all. User can just use the program to get all those answers, and then that's the best program, right? That's the optimal program right? if you can just answer everything, and then. What that means is that the how much we can compress all those answers that we need to give into a small, tiny program. And then that's where the connection to the compression comes in. So the, the idea is that the best program is the program that's going to have the smallest number of bits together with the data that's going to be sent from the Alice, the programmer, to the user. So that is the best program. And then you have to, that's how we connect it to compression. Mm -hmm. So then what does it mean to compress the data? Once we have the compression, we need to send, to, we end up with the two artifacts. One is a decompression algorithm because the compression turns it into a code that is shorter, but that code needs to be decompressed by the user eventually. So we need both the decompressor and the actual bits that represent the compressed data. And then what that means is that the, in fact, when we say size of the compressed, let's say data, that should include not only just the number of bits that have resulted from the program, but also how we decompress it. And then in the case of the prediction, which is the compression, this decompressor is the resulting model. That's why when we look at the minimum description length, that is the the minimum number of bits we need in order to compress the data, let's say D here, that consists not only of the coded number of the bits we need to send, uh, you, uh, we need in order to compress it, but the model that we would need in order to decompress it eventually. That's why we have to actually take into account both of these components. Now, that, mean, that actually does not mean that we have to use the number of the parameters here directly. You can say that you can see why there is a constant here. This C is that they, because you know we may be able to compress the number of the uh, the parameters in the model as well to a certain degree, or you know we may need actually you know we let's say if you use a flow sixteen, we need the sixteen bits for individual parameters. Now, but again, this is just a one very naive way to do so. Eventually. Here's also one example. Eventually what you end up with is that the number of bits we need to compress, uh, number of bits resulting from the compressed data plus the complexity of the algorithm or the decompression algorithm. And then the complexity in fact corresponds to the complexity of the model or the hypothesis space. And then that actually corresponds to regularization. So in fact, what you see here is not just merely about the number of the parameters, which is a kind of elusive, let's say, concept anyway. It's more like the, in order to get the generalization accuracy, it's not only about how well we have compressed this training set or the set that we have, but it's also about the complexity of the model. And then that's how we actually bound the generalization error. So in a sense, it's not really about the number of the parameters, about the complexity of the decompression algorithm. Thereby, what you really care about is this whole thing, not just how well it predicts the training examples and the test. And why is this better than the test set? Because often the test set is too small and then it has a too high a variance. And then without taking into account the complexity, we cannot tell whether it's going to work really well in the deployment time. Thanks, I think the intuition is better now. Thank you. All right. Was there another question in the center somewhere? Or was it was the same question? Was it the same? I definitely did not actually answer it correctly. Well, I explained it well then. <laughs> all right. Any other questions on along the all three actually aspect? Yes. Oh, I see. Yeah, so the, uh, I'll repeat the question. Um, early on today, uh, I talked about you know, the idea. I have some thoughts about the what Yejin pre presented yesterday about this kind of a say self distillation type of thing. And it's not only about the Yejin's work there, but there are a lot of let's say discussions about 
using language model to produce more data, to train a better language model. And then you had the people say that, oh, we can do it you know, the iteratively to get better and better. So there are, I have a lot of thoughts about that, but you know, the, let's just imagine that the, let's start with a very simple case. So I have trained the model and then this model is probabilistic. And then I'm going to now sample from this. And then I'm going to train another model. Let's say the, there is always going to be some error. So we, we, uh, let's assume that our learning algorithm is imperfect. What that means is that the, we want to, we are essentially learning what the model already has learned, the original model has learned because we're sampling from it. So no unbiased sample. So we're just doing the sampling plus some noise because our learning is imperfect. And then now we're going to generate sample from this and then we do it again. It's going to be what this model has learned. That is the original information content plus a noise plus another noise because the learning is imperfect. And if you repeat it iteratively, then you end up actually learning a uniform distribution or the noise distribution, let's say Gaussian. So, okay, this cannot work. So then you have the, can we actually make it work? Then you can imagine that the, what if we actually introduce some bias? Maybe the unbiased sampling is what is going to kill everything. So then what you can do is that instead of sampling the answer, we're going to do the argmax. So we're going to take the most likely answer alone. And then we're going to use that to train the next model. This is actually slightly different from the previous scenario because you know, the, even if you repeat it, it's not necessarily going to go into the, let's say, no, noise only distribution. Not necessarily, we don't know where it's going to go. It go to, I mean, the, we need to put much more, let's say, constraints as well as a setup, but it's going somewhere, but not going into this kind of, let's say, maximum entropy distribution. But then you know, the, what does this mean? This actually connects, there was a paper from the Yasha Benjiro in 2006 or so, about minimum entropy principle for the semi-supervised learning. What you, and then you know, the, if you can think of the argmax as you know, the sampling from the you know, lowest temperature distribution, so that has a very minimal entropy, and then that's going to that's going to kind of have some kind of contribution. And then in semi-supervised learning, that can be helpful once in a while. Not always; it doesn't really work well in practice, but something like that. So then you at the one say that okay. So then what is this bias that is being added, right? Every time we use the you know, the uh, argmax and then use that to you know the train another model. Everyone has their own answers, but in my opinion, you know the that's a really weird thing to rely on. So some principle that is minimizing entropy, I think that's always a big mistake because minimum entropy actually corresponds to maximizing the complexity as well to a certain degree, which is opposite of what we're supposed to do. So that's the one thought. But then of course, people say that it's always a self-improvement, but it's not self-improvement. There's always human component or there's some kind of say, extra component that comes in that gives some kind of, a, say, I don't know, preferences or some kind of feedback in the middle. So maybe you know, what they're saying is that the, if our distribution matches the true distribution close enough, then all we need is a bit, bit of a feedback that's going to tilt it toward the true distribution. And then you know, how do we incorporate the feedback? We actually don't know exactly how to, but you know, if, you, if you think about all this RLHF and so on, what they are saying is that, the, well, we're going to sample from the existing model and then all these samples are going to be rescored by this reward model and reward model was trained using the human feedback so there was an information that was injected and then you retune the model so it's a it's actually not really a self distillation it was a distillation plus the you know the reward, uh, fit, human feedback so then you know, the maybe it's going to work but it looks like you know, the feedback tends to be too noisy and also the human feedback is only for the problems that are so easy and then most of the real world problems that we really want to solve challenging problems, human feedback is kind of as a pretty much, you know, they uh, use it. So for instance, as an example, I work at Genentech. So we do the antibody design for, you know, the various diseases and so on. Let's say, you know, the, we, our algorithm gave us some antibody, let's say design. We can't go to the mechanical Turk and ask, let's say five Turkers, do you think this antibody is going to actually tackle this disease? We want to get a random, let's say, cheaper, let's say feedback, right? So I feel like this kind of self distillation using the RLHF is only possible because we are only, we are not being ambitious enough. So there's a, a lot of thoughts there, yes. But anyway, yeah, I hope that that answers partly what you wanted to ask. We get the question. Yeah. Just a very quick one off the bat of that. What about, um, has anyone tried uh, training a denoiser mm -hmm. um, off the bat of self distillation? 
because obviously that's in like the fusion model is that it's quite um, mm. the image. But has anyone tried that with natural language processes? Yeah, so the question is whether there could be a denoiser between this uh, process of the self distillation and whether they can be helpful. But then the thing is that the, the data that you use in order to train these language models are exactly going to the data that you can use to train this kind of uh, denoiser. So I don't think uh, from the information content perspective, it doesn't really change anything. But now, of course, the denoising model tends to have a different inductive bias. So the uh, so there will be some, let's say, bias introduced that is different from the bias introduced when we train this kind of left to right order regressive model. And you know, the, you know, we want to believe in some magic. So if you believe in magic, and then some of those biases can actually, you know, the, I don't know, work together in a positive way. So maybe, but I don't think there is uh, anything that we can say that uh, concretely wh whether it's going to be helpful or not. So, yep. Um, yeah, thank you for your talk. And I find very interesting the evaluation using the uh, the different kind of uh, approaches you took. So um, a quick uh, unpopular data-based question. <laughs> so um, I wonder, do you measure how sensitive this kind of uh, approach and evaluation is to the data? to like the IID assumption, which I generally think is very questionable when you evaluate stuff and to like distribution shifts. Cause we know that like test accuracy depends a lot on like if you go out of the main, if you have like difficulty in the examples that is changing. So how how sensitive is, is this approach to that? Cause I, my intuition is that it should be more sensitive than like testing. Mm. Yeah, so the uh, if there is some kind of distribution or shift I'm pretty sure this is just as sensitive as any any other approaches because it does still assume that the data set comes from a single distribution and then it will in the future as well. Now, is it more sensitive? I'm not entirely sure. We didn't test it, that's a good point, but the, at least what we have seen is that the, uh, okay. So the most of these problems when the IID actually kind of largely uh, holds, then the variance we get from, let's say, varying some of the uh, hyperparameters, like the ordering of the examples and so on, is very small. It, so in this, in all these figures, there were actually error bar where we are varying the, let's say, ordering and then varying the model architecture and so on. And then that's actually pretty small. So assuming IID, things are kind of pretty good. This is good. Without assuming IID, uh, we're kind of, let's say, already doomed to start with. So for that one, we probably need to approach it from a completely different angle by saying that, okay, what kind of distribution shift are we talking about? And then for individual cases, what is the right way to make a robust classifier? There, yes. Yep. Yeah, so the uh, Ellis and Bob ends up with the exactly same model. Parameter wise, I mean, depending on the learning algorithm, but the, if it's a, uh, you know, training this kind of parameterized model, yes, we're going to end up with, they're going to end up with the exactly same thing. Yes, yes. You can literally imagine that the what if this learning algorithm comes together with computers as well. And so how does the both people models and actually get the same one? Yeah, oh so yeah, the yes, this is a very kind of a say abstract, impractical picture, of course, right? So you can imagine that the uh Alice is sending the entire let's say data center to the bot to run it. So they are perfect, perfectly synchronized. This is the assumption here. Now in reality, of course, we don't implement it by having actual Alice and Bob. We just implement it on a one computer or the one machine set up just to estimate this, you know, the, the tight upper bound to the uh, minimum description length, but we don't really send anything directly. We assume that something's being sent. Yep. Also, 
I see. Yeah, so uh, one suggestion I have is to read a position paper, very recent one that was put forward by a bunch of people, including the Phil Blunsom, who is now at core here. Uh, the title starts with uh, on the scientific depths of the NLP or the language model. And then there, that paper, as well as there are a few other papers that I can recommend you. Uh, and then one of them is you know, by the Surinam Im from you know, the Meta, who actually wrote a paper comparing all those you know, the so-called triplet loss space, you know, the, uh, you know, the approaches to learn the sim uh, similarity automatically from the data. Uh, and then you know, the, they actually tested all those algorithms from the span of the 15 years. And then they show that they will actually, if you put everything comparable and then run the experiments, the best algorithm turned out to be the one from the 2005. And then all the subsequent algorithms, the improvements were actually because the experiments were not done correctly or you know, did not done well. And the same thing with the scientific paper from the of NLP. So the, I think we tend to, so the one, one great thing about machine learning and computer science in general is that the, we move really fast and that we can improve very, very well because we often you know, rely on the standardized benchmark and then trying to see whether we are doing better and better. If we do really well, we come up with the next benchmark and on and on. But at the same time, the issue there is that the, we tend to be a bit blinded by this, you know, the accuracy improvement to the point that the, we kind of say stop too prematurely and don't really figure out what were the actual contributing factors to those accuracies. So trying to figure that out is really important. And that's important for writing papers, writing good papers, or the papers that are going to stand the test of the time. Now, of course, uh, often you, know, the, the, you just see the high accuracy and like, ah, oh, great, let's write a paper. <laughs> but uh, those papers eventually will either be forgotten or are going to be very rapidly superseded by the other paper that is also just not doing the correct, let's say, kind of, let's say, science or the experimentation, but just shows another, let's say, improvements and the, I don't know, accuracy or something like that. So I think that practically, I want us to just know that the actually writing a paper, in particular, empirical paper is really difficult. Yeah, it's really difficult. So there's so many papers, I mean, so many things are things that we don't need to report almost always. Okay, thank you. Thank you.